are going to get started. We are just a minute over here. Um, so the first thing is to uh, review and approve the agenda. Uh, and just so you all are aware, my hope is to um, switch a couple of items. One is um, the very last item on our agenda, or actually item 11, is a council response to Halloween. Um, there was a letter from Marissa Earl Centers. Um, Marissa, um, I, I was in touch with Marissa's mother, who I think um, had hoped that Marissa would join us um, for the meeting. So I'd like to move that item up to, um, we'll, we'll see if, if they're on after the consent agenda. And if not, then maybe we'll do it after the appointments. Um, and then uh, sort of swapping that sort of um, with the um, uh, committee assignments to fill uh, Councillor Richardson's vacancies, um, that's going to go um, at, at the uh, end where the Halloween um, response was. Um, so that will be um, item, the new item 11. Um, and I think uh, there's, there, we do have, um, or we do have uh, one change to the consent agenda, but we'll talk about that when we get to the consent agenda. Other than that, I think um, I don't know of any other changes to the agenda. Thoughts? No. Okay, great. Uh, all right, so with that, we'll consider the agenda approved and on to general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, if you do have something that you want to say that does relate to an agenda item, we'll provide a time um, as we get to that item for, for you to speak. Um, but if it's not on our agenda, otherwise now is the time to, um, to bring that up. And if you would try to keep your comments to two minutes and say um, where you are from and um, where you, oh yeah, <laughs> your name and where you're from, um, that would be helpful. And that's true for generally speaking, all public comments. Um, try to keep it to two minutes, name and where you're from. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, my pillar. I wanted to speak uh, on the agenda issue. There was significant confusion after the last meeting because there was a request made to pull the dispatch contract from the consent agenda. It was marked for discussion. Even after the meeting, Jack wasn't sure what had happened with it. Neither was the town clerk. Further evident, further research indicates that it was pulled and put back on and voted uh, and approved, even though it was, had been marked for discussion. It's a substantial issue that Dan Richardson had done due diligence on, and none, no one else on the council has. So there's a significant problems with our dispatch service and that need to be aired in the context prior to that contract being executed, both on the month on the, both the party, the city as party and capital fire as counterparty uh, has chronic issues with uh, open meeting and uh, minutes, etc. Um, but there are life health and safety issues with the way our current dispatch is being run that need to be aired. So I had asked uh, Jay and Lauren to add it to the agenda to reconsider last week's vote and pull that dispatch contract item off of last week's vote reapprove the remainder of last week's last vote and then add to the agenda or under other business a discussion of the dispatch contract or possibly defer that until uh you'll have more a whole bunch of public safety people in here next week who can offer other perspectives on that topic um I think I did that use up my two minutes. That was really a point of order. Uh, yesterday, a person uh, fell on a bicycle along the multi-use path and one of the trash tramps, uh, bless their heart for being willing to be called that, called 911. There was no response 15 minutes later. Uh, I found the same person had fallen again over right by the pedestrian bridge next to Shaw's laying in the, in the brambles with a bicycle laying on top of him. Uh, by then it had been 20 minutes. Uh, I walked to the firehouse. There was no response to the bell or a knock. Apparently they were out on training. I walked to the dispatch center and was told, oh, we've got two officers out there looking for him. 
and I said, why isn't the ambulance been called? And it's like the ambulance won't be called unless the officer calls for the ambulance. And I said, that's not the way it works. Normally the ambulance beats the police officers to these events. Anyway, the guy had got, gotten up, I had helped him up. He went and he fell a third time, smashing his face into the gravel and the steel rail and was bleeding significantly by the time the ambulance arrived in seven minutes after they were called. But the fact that our dispatch after two 911 calls had not dispatched the ambulance for close to 30 minutes is a real problem. Um, I agreed with this person. I helped him get home safe. He refused transport uh, against medical advice. And uh, I contacted him today to find out he's all right, but I agreed not to use his name. That's one example of what's wrong with our dispatch. Thank you. Um, Alyssa, uh, I see you have your hand up. Yes, hi. Because I am here on the police matter, I thought I'd bring up a different matter um, just very briefly here. The district heat issue in the city. Um, first off, I know I've emailed all the counselors about this issue, um, the, but for the public that's here right now, district heat uh, capacity charges are increasing for some of the folks on the system pretty significantly. And so I want to thank the council for paying attention to this matter and working with the city on it. Um, right now, the, uh, the city has been working with different nonprofit entities whose charges have gone way up, like Christchurch, for example. It's gone up from 16000 to 42000 um, this year, which is a pretty significant jump and one that the church won't be able to pay. Uh, so I have really appreciated the city's posture in terms of working with us to try to find a way to pay for this. I'm keeping it on the city council's radar because I think there probably needs to be a nonprofit policy created or some sort of mechanism to consider when customers cannot pay what to do with them, like any utility um, would. And, you know, in our case, uh, given the significant increase, it will be about $26,000 increase per year over 10 years. So it's like $260,000. And we can't finance that because the church doesn't have that kind of revenue just to finance it over time. So um, I just wanted to keep this on your radar and keep engaged with you all as we're also working with the city to figure out what not only this year um, could look like in terms of the payment, but long term, because we want to, you know, make this work and remain obviously part of District Heat for a variety of reasons, including um, environmental and it reflects our values. Uh, we are also in the interim, just to be clear, working with Efficiency Vermont to do anything we can to weatherize and conserve um, heat, and then also are um, applying for grants with uh, Vermont. Uh, interface power and light to uh, see if we might be able to get like a, a flow control on the system, which would help curb our peaks. And so there's work we can do. And we're going to commit to doing that work. And then also wanted to bring it to your attention because I think there's a broader policy question here uh, and wanted to keep that matter before you. And I look forward to speaking with you a little bit more later on the police issue. Great. Thank you. All right, uh, anyone else, either in person or online? Okay, uh, all right, and um, oh, I see, I see you, Deborah. Uh, <laughs> thanks for raising your hand. Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, this is for a two minute public comment. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm going to read this, excuse me. Um, my name is Deborah Messing and I live on Charles Street. Um, on September 11th, uh, exactly a month ago, my husband and I walked to the state um, to the Taste of Montpelier event. And we thought the situation there was just way too risky. Uh, people were jammed into a crowded area, waiting in long lines, no social distancing, many unmasked, quite a few out-of-state cars on the surrounding streets. Um, the next day, the digger reported 405 cases over the weekend, over that weekend. Um, <clears throat> on September 13th, I wrote Dan Groberg, the executive director of Montpelier Alive, about my concerns. 
uh, he responded that he relies on the guidance from the Vermont Department of Health and that countless other events um, around the state were taking place. The Arts Hop in Burlington, the Waterbury Arts Festival, county fairs, indoor events at the Flynn and Higher Ground, et cetera. And this wasn't very reassuring to us. Um, I wanna say that I respect Dan Groberg and I understand it must have seemed prudent to follow the guidance of the Vermont Department of Health. I wrote him that um, perhaps in this case, coming to independent conclusion might've been more prudent especially at food tasting event where masks, even if worn, would be lowered frequently. I quoted Lisa M. Lee, a research professor of population health sciences at Virginia Polytechnic Institute, who wrote about outdoor transmissibility of Delta vaccine. She wrote that the Delta virus burst the bubble on the idea that outdoor activities are generally safe. Yes, the virus is less likely to be transmitted outdoors, but it depends. You are at greater risk if you are face to face with someone breathing in the breath they are exhaling, even if you are outside. And if, as far as social distancing, playing sports or exercising outdoors is much less likely to result in spreading the virus, say than being in a crowded outdoor concert, or I would add, uh, in a jammed outdoor food tasting event. And here we are uh, a month later, Washington County had the highest daily COVID count since September, 2020. Can this be traced to this event? I don't even know how to find this out, but even if not too risky, I was told they didn't expect such large crowds, although they vigorously promoted the event. I suggest that in the future, limit the number of people, require masks, or even vaccinations. Um, I was gratified to read today that the Midnight Madness event on October 22nd does require masks, indoor and outdoor, and the events seem more spread out. I would hope that those in charge of such events in the future act with an abundance of caution. And one last thing, why can't the Montpelier Health Officer who is supposed to act, quote, proactively to protect the community from public health threats, including special situations, I would say, including massive overcrowding at a public event during a pandemic, be around to limit the number of attendees. Thank you much. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, it's actually, that's kind of an uh, interesting lead into our conversation about Halloween that's coming up, actually. Um, so thank you for that. And um, we'll, we'll talk more about masking, I think, uh, pretty soon. Um, all right. So we are going to, uh, anyone else? Okay. I'm not seeing anyone else. Um, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the, so, um, regarding street closures, um, the uh, the one that's listed last on the online uh, agenda is uh, the repainting of the Black Lives Matter mural. Uh, that was going to be with uh, high school students, but they have since changed their plans, and they're not going to be able to do that. Um, so, um, unfortunately, um, that is not uh, something that they're they're asking for at, at this point. Um, so uh, anyway, we can take that off. Any other thoughts or comments about the consent agenda? Or is there a motion? I'll second it. Okay, motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, and opposed. All right, so the consent agenda passes. And now we are going to, um, because of our, our change of order, um, we're going to jump to our discussion about the council's response to Halloween 2021, which is coming up. And I we had received a letter from um, Marissa Earl Centers, who I believe is has joined us um, through uh, the Zoom. And uh, Marissa, if you're there, um, we'd love to uh, just hear your thoughts on this. We know you wrote a letter. Um, to us, but uh, if if you wouldn't mind sharing with us um, your your thoughts on what we ought to do uh, regarding Halloween. Um. 
Can you hear me? Um, I really like Halloween and, um, I, uh, I like going trick-or-treating a lot and, uh, last year I was really sad when, um, we weren't allowed to, um, go trick-or-treating because it's really fun and, um, I feel like if you don't want to go trick-or-treating, you can just, like, stay in your house, but for the people who do want to go, it's important to me that we're allowed to go trick-or-treating. Um, does anyone have any questions for Marissa? Oh. Go ahead, Donna. I'd like to say your letter was very on point, very expressive, and really appreciate the amount of time and thought you took to send it. And it does have us definitely yes. looking at Halloween. And I, for one, uh, would like to follow your suggestions, which seem very much in line with what the health department is telling us, that in small groups outside. So uh, that's what I would propose that we do is follow those guidelines and advocate for kids to go trick-or-treating in that mode. In small groups, oh, in small groups. outside only. Yes. And um, you know, it, uh, it, doesn't hurt to, it doesn't hurt to wear a mask, right? Oh, yes. I mean, it kind of makes yes. sense, right? It's, yes. it's Halloween. Definitely. Costumes proposed. with masks yes. may be encouraged. Um, and I, yes, Lauren. That it was so great to hear from you. So glad you're engaged with your city and um, bringing up issues you care about. So keep it up. Um, if, the only thing I would add on the masking, there is a recommendation from some health authorities, like don't wear this kind of face mask and another mask over it for kids because it could be a breathing hazard. So they recommend generally avoiding like face masks that aren't a kind of like COVID protective mask. Oh, okay. um, so just that recommendation. I know we're you know not allowed to mandate masking, but strongly recommend COVID safe masking um, as well, even outdoors. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? I don't think we need a, a motion on this, um, right? We're, we're just making a recommendation um, to the community at this point. Um, okay, any other further thoughts on on this? Yes, Connor, yeah. I, I don't think we asked Marissa what she was going to be for Halloween. She's a very passionate advocate. I, I'd love to know what the costume is, Marissa. Am I Thomas? Um, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> what, what would you like to be for Halloween, Marissa? Uh, I actually have no idea. <laughs> okay. There's still time. Anything could happen. You better send us a picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you again, Marissa, for um, uh, for writing to us, and we hope you have fun uh, trick or treating in small groups outside uh, this Halloween. Thank you. Would yes. Statement go into like the city manager's report. I just pass. You know, you're not, you obviously don't have authority over this. You can pass a. a just a statement of you know the city council supports Halloween under these conditions or something. Because yeah. last year we offered we passed a statement said we recommend no. Right. Okay. Okay. I'll make that okay. as Go a ahead. motion that the the council is supporting people going children going out for Halloween trick or treating small groups. We advise regular COVID mask and lots of illumination and, and outside <laughs> flashlights reflective material somewhere on their wonderful costumes and outside outside yes outside I'll second. okay we have a motion and a second any further discussion on this yes jay sorry i just want to ask a quick question i'm wondering part of this do we need to um make a recommendation or engage in all with, with the with montpelier alive um and the partners in education that are joining for a um, for the Halloween trick-or-treating event, which is in place of the fall festival from last year. It's trick-or-treating. I think they're doing a mile fun run and could potentially, I mean, especially um, in light of Deborah's comments around um, large gatherings. So we, I know that we can't necessarily 
um, you know, they, they will, we can certainly trust them in that they will be following, you know, state guidelines in terms of what, what's appropriate for larger outdoor gatherings, but I don't know if that's something we need to address as part of this conversation or not. Interesting point. Um, yeah, Donna, go ahead. I, I feel like for adult guidance, they already exist. And if we make this statement, hopefully uh, Montpelier Live and the merchants will reflect it. So I think we can make the statement and they can integrate it into their own. So I feel we can go ahead and do it. Okay, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. I just want to acknowledge that there is a larger yep. event plan for that day. Yep. And so, yep. so I think I, that's fair. I'm with you on that, but I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. And yeah, maybe this will you. help them be more mindful of small outdoor groups and masks. Right. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay, motion in a second. Any further discussion? Um, including from the public? Okay. Uh, so um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that recommendation passes. And uh, thank you again, Marissa, for uh, bringing this up for us. Okay, all right. Before so Before we take up another issue, yep. I'm, I'm getting messages that members are very hard to hear on, uh, on YouTube. And so the sound guy might be working on that now, but, uh, oh, I think it just picked up. But... <laughs> Keep so us posted. We should maybe keep trying. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so we are going to move on to uh, some appointments that we have to make. And I think I have seen a number of uh, these folks uh, present with us. Um, and so um, I'm just going to go in the order that you know, that folks are listed online. Uh, Aaron Kasicki, I see that you are with us. Um, would you mind uh, introducing yourself to us uh, and uh, just tell us about your interest in serving on the Planning Commission? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me here really quickly. I just wanted to say um, I've been on the Planning Commission for the past three years and I've been serving as uh, vice chair for the past, uh, the past two years. Um, I'll just be very short and sweet with it. Uh, we've been working very hard on uh, drafting the new city plan. We are very much, uh, you know, waist deep in that effort right now. And uh, we we have a good working group. Um, I think we've been very productive, uh, but we've got quite a ways to go to get that project across the, the finish line. And I'd like to be, continue to be involved in that project, um, you know, to see that through. And also, you know, all the time we are working on, uh, you know, changes to zoning laws, which um, there's a certain learning curve to that. And I feel like I'm getting on top of that. So uh, I feel like I'm actually of some, some you know, some value <laughs> in that department now. So I'd like to continue. So I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, your time and uh, I hope to be reappointed. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, Arian Kassam, I see you're on um, next. If you wouldn't mind doing the same. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I'll just keep it short. Like Erin, I think I've been on the planning commission about the same time, maybe three and a half years. And um, I feel like there is a learning curve and I feel like I am getting more familiar and understanding zoning a lot better. So I'd really like to continue both with the work on the city plan and any you know zoning changes that we might be able to make. I work um, and affordable housing and I really want to bring more housing to the city and it's really important to me, so I hope to be reappointed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, I don't see uh, Gabriel Lajeunesse. Um, I, I just want to make sure I'm not wrong uh, here. I don't I didn't see him online. Um, all right, uh, or Jeffrey Batista. Is Jeffrey Batista here? Nope, okay. Um, and John Adams, I didn't think I saw John online. Okay, and uh, Kirby, Kirby is online. Kirby. Yes, yes, she's a last one. <laughs> Hi everyone. Yes, welcome. Um, so yeah, I'm Kirby Keaton. I'm currently the chair of the uh, Planning Commission. I've been chair for about two, two and a half years now. Before that, I was the vice chair. I've been on the Planning Commission for about five and a half years. 
Um, as Aaron was saying, you know, we're working on the city plan right now. We have about half of the uh, work done there as far as the, the chapters and our goals and strategies set up. Um, so about a half more to go. We want to finish hopefully by the end of the calendar year here. And uh, we're also working on some zoning changes currently, which we'll have a hearing on in about a month. Um, so those are some things you can expect from us in the near future. Uh, while I'm uh, talking with you, yeah, I've noticed that John Adams and Stephanie Smith aren't here right now. In case they don't end up showing, I just want to throw my support behind them, though. Uh, both of them have very deep planning backgrounds and contribute a lot to the Planning Commission. So uh, I definitely want to mention that if, if they don't make it, that they are very valuable members. Uh, and that's all I've got. Thank you very much, Kirby. And Marcella. So Dent, welcome. Hi, thanks very much. I um, appreciate your consideration and your time. And I will sound a bit like my colleagues, um, but this is my this is the end of my first um, session with the commit with the planning commission. And so I um, definitely do still feel in the thick of the learning curve. Um, but I've been just really pleased and grateful for the patience and just helpfulness of both our planning director, Mike, who's um, just been so great and helpful and knowledgeable um, and steady. And then also my fellow commissioners who have been really helpful in helping me learn um, and get up to speed on things. And so I do feel like I, I do feel like I just started and I would love to continue and see this um, city plan project through, uh, especially now that we're starting to find our groove and um, and making some progress. So I've, um, I think the, the group works well together. Um, I know we will have at least one new person, which I think is great, exciting to have, you know, new perspectives always. And um, yeah, I'm excited and would like to continue to, to do this work. So thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Keaton just mentioned Stephanie Smith and she did not apply for reappointment and we haven't received one. So just so people are aware of that. I also did not reapply. Um, okay, well, thank you. And uh, all right, so any questions for any of these candidates who are present? Okay, uh, all right, so um, some of these appointments are going to be for, uh, what, two years, and some of them are going to be uh, for one, and so um, we have to uh, <laughs> line folks up a little bit here, but um, what would you like to do? You want to go into executive session or just have a vote? Yes, go ahead, Jack. Pursuant to 1 BSA section 313A3, I move that we enter executive session to discuss the uh, uh, appointment of a public officer or employee. And is there a second? Okay, uh, we've got multiple seconds. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. Um, do you have a comment about the planning commission, folks? No, I have a general comment. Okay. Um, if if you ahead. would if you would like people to stay informed about the city council, you need to learn how to speak up. I have my computer speakers on at one hundred percent. Cannot hear you. I can hear anybody that calls in online big time, but you need to learn how to project your voices because it's very frustrating and I don't come out at night anymore. So speak up, speak into your microphones. Otherwise, otherwise, otherwise we can't follow what's going on in Montpelier and it's very frustrating. Um. Yeah, so let's let's try to if we can remind each other to uh, just yeah to get really close to it and and uh, speak up. Okay, so there was a motion and a second um, uh, about going into executive session. Um, any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Okay, and opposed. All right, so we will be right back. Actually, I.
Okay. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? Okay, uh, motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right, so we're back in regular session. Is there a motion? Jack. Make the following appointments, and there are groups, two groups of appointments. The first group will be appointed for the remainder of the term that will expire on October 1st, 2022, and that would be Marcella Dent, Kirby Keaton. Jeffrey Batista and Gabriel Lajeunesse. And I also move the appointment for two years of Aaron Kasicki, John Adams, and Ariane Kassam. Okay, is there a second? Okay, uh, Jay is going to second. Um, for any further discussion? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so um, that passes. And thank you to all of you for your work on the Planning Commission. Very grateful for all that you all that you do. My goodness. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing more from you all. Um, uh, you know, as things progress, the city plan and any um, changes to the zoning progress. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So we are now up to um, the report from the police review committee um, along with the, the recommendations in it and i know we have a, a presentation from that group and i know there's some members online and some members uh, with us in person um, i will turn it over to you all collectively as to how you want to proceed hi there uh, this is Alyssa sharon chair of police review committee uh, the plan is that will that I will share the presentation on my screen and that uh, Justin Dreschler is in the room there and he and I will tag team the presentation and so um, he should get in position whatever that looks like in the room with you all. <laughs> you, you, uh, feel free to come on up to the table up here. Thank you. And also I, I want to recognize that uh, you know, the, the committee members, which we'll, we'll, I'll go through all the names in just a minute. And I'm so sorry not to be there with you in person. The whole fifth grade has been like in quarantine and my son doesn't have his COVID test back yet. So I figured I would just skip this in-person session with you all today. So Justin is helping to pick up the slack. Thank you um, so much. Um, before we go into the presentation, I see that you have a hand um, up. So should I pause for that? Um, sure. Abby is a is a police review committee member, so perhaps it's about the presentation. Yes, um, I was wondering if uh, I could make a public comment beforehand, um, if it's at, like an agenda item that is taking public comment. Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, so here's how I um, picture the, the this, thank you for that, because I, I think laying out how this uh, agenda item will go, uh, I think is uh, in order. Um, so um the way we're going to structure this time is we'll have the presentation happen first uh and then uh we'll go from there into um just clarifying questions from the council no no opinions just like if you don't understand something or need um more information about something we'll go into that from there we'll go into that that's when we'll um go into public comment um so at that point you know, anyone um, would be welcome to make a, a comment about or or a question or whatever um, about uh, the this report, uh, and then and then the council will have a, a discussion um, about the the, uh, the content of it, and we'll we'll go on from there. Um, does that work for you, Abby? Yes, thank okay. you. Great, thank you, and thank you for that question. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it back to you, Alyssa. Great. Well, I'm going to share my screen then on the presentation, and I assume folks will be able to see it in the room there. Um, yes. That... Okay. Yeah. And... Okay. Great. Thank you. 
we can see it. Okay, great. Um, Mayor Watson, we were planning on uh, pausing for to take your questions at a couple points along the way. Should we not do that and just move through and save it to the end based on what you just described? No, you can. I mean, if that's a part of your um, your plan, that's perfectly fine. So just um, give us a heads up when those points are and um, uh, we'll we'll field questions at that point. Okay, that sounds okay. great. Thank you so much. Um, so let me jump in here. Alyssa Shuren, a Montpelier resident and committee chair for the Police Review Committee. And first, I just want to really thank all of the committee members. Um, each have specialized in different topics throughout this process and are on hand to assist with questions in the areas that they've specialized in over the last uh, nearly a year now. And I, I want to do a special thank you to Justin Dressler, who's there with you in the room um, for drafting the report and being present uh, today uh, to help me as I cannot be with you. Um, also, um, I was told that you have read the report and have the presentation slide. So we're not going to go through every single slide today. We're going to cover the high points and then um, leave a little bit more time for discussion. So diving in, we worked diligently to complete, complete uh, the committee's charge, but uh, and this is the charge here on the slide. The one thing I would just note about the charge is that we were uh, charged with getting you the report by June 30th, 2021, and we are delayed on that. But we are very happy to get you uh, the report today. As you know, uh, this is a timeline which I'm going to go through, um, but as you know, the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and many others at the hands of police violence spurred heightened protests across the country and in Montpelier. Community members expressed an interest in police reforms, and on June 10th, uh, 2020, you, the council, adopted a resolution condemning racism and police brutality. Around that time, uh, Montpelier Police Department Chief Brian Pete was hired and undertook an assessment of the department. He offered a framework for the future of MPD, and on August 26, 2020, the City Council approved that framework, which included the recommendation to create a police review committee to assess and work collaboratively with community members, counselors, and MPD on a strategic vision for the police department. On October 28th, 2020, the Montpelier City Council appointed six community members to serve on the Police Review Committee. The PRC was encouraged to suggest additional members to the City Council, and we explored recommending up to five additional committee members. Three of the five we reached out to identify as people of color. Through this recruitment process, we received feedback from these potential members that the few Black, Indigenous, and people of color in Montpelier, making up about 6.3% of the population, are frequently asked to engage in community processes, share lived experiences, and serve on committees, and that many BIPOC people in Montpelier are overtaxed, overengaged, and exhausted, especially given the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial reckoning connected to police violence we've seen over the past year, which was so acutely felt. Uh, the three potential BIPOC committee members declined to participate and suggested that the PRC center BIPOC voices in our work, and we attempted to do that in our outreach. In January 2021, the City Council appointed two additional committee members, bringing the committee to eight, which was our total and final number. Uh, all members are white, and other identities range from cisgender, transgender, and gender nonconforming, queer and straight those with lived mental health experiences and conditions, disabled and enabled, and backgrounds include teaching, mental health work, legal work, criminal justice work, and public interest work. Our approach was to collect and analyze data from November of 2020 to January 2021, and then also um, consider gaps and needs and engage, I'm sorry, June 2021, and consider gaps and needs and engage stakeholders and then draft uh, and then draft recommendations. Each committee member specialized in a few topics and prepared recommendation 
rationale. And uh, those then um, were presented to the committee. We discussed them, uh, we asked questions, and then ultimately we voted. And the recommendations that received the majority, um, a majority vote made it into the report. We solicited um, community input throughout this process as well. And um, we also took public comments on the report uh, for a two week period after it was drafted. And then we present, present you with the, um, with the final report today. So let me hand it over to Justin at this point to take us through some of the data, and then I'll come back to you with some community engagement. Good evening, everyone. Justin Dreschler. Holler at me if my voice is not loud enough. So I'm going to go through data collection and analysis. This is distinct from our community outreach and engagement, which certainly is data, but this is more um, quantitative data that we looked at from the police department, as well as academic studies, things along those lines. Alyssa, you can go to the next slide. And so you can see this is the type of data that we got. By quantitative, we mean just reports from the police department of various kinds, arrest reports, use of force reports, things along those lines, um, offense reports, dispatch numbers, expert presentations, meaning presentations largely from the chief, some presentations on bias and racial uh, trafficking stops, presentation from DA Tebow, from Ari Springer on the, DA, on the defense bar, Academic reports, news, nonprofit websites, et cetera, et cetera. We tried really hard to cite our work here. So the, the report has many, 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 many footnotes, um, largely thanks to Michael Sherman. And so we tried very, very hard that when we're making a claim that we try to back it up with the data to the extent that any claim is not backed up in the report that you can see in an obvious way, you should always just click through to the recommendation because there's so much more behind the report, even though it's already pretty meaty. You can click through, Alyssa. So this is just the Montpelier Police Department profile. There's nothing particularly interesting here. These are just stats about the Montpelier Police Department that a lot of the city council already knows. Some of the public might not necessarily know this. I guess the big takeaway here is, and it's not on this slide, but that the police department is understaffed right now. And so the PD is working. Um, oh, the chief can give this to me. Let me see if I have it memorized from the morning shift or day shift has two officers, what I would call swing shift, which is 12 or 6 p.m. to midnight has three officers, and then grave has two officers. Full staffing is three officers on all shifts, so you can see we are understaffed. That has required a uh, significant amount of overtime over the, last, uh, over the last year or so. But other than that, no really meaningful takeaways from this. This isn't something we, we looked at, same size as communities of uh, of similar sizes across Vermont. We don't see any sort of discrepancies like we have three times as many officers per capita or anything along those lines. And we cited to a number of different communities in the report telling you how many officers per capita they have. Next. This is us breaking out the percentage of the calls that are coming into the MPD in terms of whether they have a police response or whether they were handled entirely by the dispatcher. And this is just, a, this is just interesting to look at from my perspective in the sense that it's telling you how often dispatchers are short circuiting some of these things. It's in some ways it doesn't tell us too much because many of the calls that come to the police state, the MPD, have no business going to an officer. For example, they are the it's a restraining order holding station, and so the dispatchers are supposed to handle calls like that. Lost and found property, obviously a dispatcher can handle that. So a number of these calls that are going into the PD. Are, are not ever going to find their way to an officer. And we actually see a consistent pattern that about 85% of the calls end up finding their way to an officer. And again, I want to be clear, this doesn't necessarily mean that an officer is responding to the scene. It just means that the individual, that an officer is contacted at some point along the way, as opposed to just completely cut out of the process. You can go next, Alyssa. This is us bucketing the calls that actually involve the call to a police officer into a number of different categories. And I tried to be really clear in the report here that this involves judgment. So there are 200 different categories that we have that we're taking a look at in this data. And we had to put it in or more specifically, I had to put it into these buckets. And so this is my work. So if you have a problem with it, come to me and I'm, I'm happy to justify it in some way. When, when there was a question, I tried to bucket things in the criminal bucket. So if it was arguably criminal, I tried very hard to put it into criminal. 
And so you see motor vehicle related. Those are non-criminal motor vehicle related things. Really anything criminal or potentially criminal found its way into that bucket. You can see that other is pretty big, but there are a number of things that police officers in town do that aren't necessarily related to, um, to public safety. Well, no, that's the wrong way to put it. To deterring crime, for example, business to bank escorts, lost and found property, um, missing children, lots of things that can fall into that bucket. And so I, I hesitate to, um, for anyone to jump to the conclusion that that's wasteful in any way without looking at the data. So it, I hesitate for anyone to jump to any conclusions from this chart without looking at the data yourself because it's interesting and it's not complicated and it's all in the resources. So please do look at it yourself, but it's important to contextualize it a little bit for the casual reader. Next, Alyssa. And here's a chart just breaking down over the last five, six years, excuse me, that this is the total number of offenses that we have in each particular category. And these are the, the leading offenses, the, uh, the heavy hitters. This, from my perspective, is good news. You can see that violent crime does not appear to be a problem in Montpelier based on these numbers. We also, and if any committee members want to correct me, we did not receive any significant amount of feedback suggesting that people were concerned about violent crime in Montpelier or overly concerned about violent crime in Montpelier. That was not something that was uh, necessarily on people's people's radar. Now, with that is not to say that there wasn't there weren't concerns expressed related to interactions with police in related to uh, violence on the part of police because we did receive a lot of feedback related to that, but we did not hear people saying that they were worried. Um, about violent crime and that, you know, they, uh, they were worried their kids were going to get hurt in the streets, et cetera, et cetera. All right, we can pass on to the next next slide. We're going to blow through this one pretty quickly. So this is pulled from the um, Stephanie Seguino's presentation to the PRC and from her. Everyone, I would think everyone on this committee understands that she did a, uh, a survey of my, of police stops across Vermont to try to determine whether they were racially motivated. Long story short, Montpelier shows no such racial motivation. Um, the caveat being there that this is not statistically significant in any way. And so we really can't, um, we can't take anything away from this at all, except to say that there is no obvious problem in front of us right now, but just keep it on your radar. Next, use of force incidents. This, this chart breaks down the number of use of force incidents in the Montpelier Police Department over the last one, two, three, four, five years, and how often officers are using force as a percent of offenses and as a percent of arrests. And the reason there is that distinction is because an offense does not necessarily lead to an arrest. So all offenses are not arrests, all arrests are offenses, Ramba Square situation. You can see that the uh, what I think is interesting about this data is that the the frequency with which officers are using force decreased significantly after 2016, 2017. I don't know what to make of it. Maybe the chief can give us some insight into it. It's, it's good news if that's decreasing for a, any number of reasons. I would also express some caution about these numbers because I think we all, oftentimes we think about use of force as something quite violent. And that is not necessarily, I'm sorry, no, I, I wanna rephrase that. All forms of use of force are violent in some way because the use of words can be considered violent and the use of empty hand controls can be considered violent. I just want to express to the reader here and to the council that this is not suggesting that in 3% of all offenses, a Montpelier police officer even puts their hands on someone or causes an injury or anything along those lines. The plurality of uses of force by the MPD every year, and by plurality I mean the, the category of use of force that was used most often was empty hand control. So that's just, that's your hands. Again, can be quite violent. I do not want to minimize this in any way. But if you add empty hand controls and verbal commands, you get to a majority of, uh, of the use of force by MPD officers over the last several years. So again, I take a look at this. We have it in a... Uh, in a spreadsheet in our in our documents very easy to read you can see each year how often they're doing each we can go to next Alyssa let me see what's on the next slide I might want to go back for half a second what? yeah it's actually just the okay. community engagement piece I want to say one last thing too yeah I want to say one last thing about that Alyssa and so you will see in the uh in the use of force reports that 
that they categorize, excuse me, they, they have a category for displaying firearms, both displaying a firearm, pointing a firearm, number of firearm category, firearm related categories. Of course, in 2020, that number jumps significantly, very, very rarely do, does the MPD ever display a firearm, let alone use a firearm. If you look at the use of force reports, it very rarely are they, are they doing these things. Again, police presence with a firearm on their hip can be quite intimidating for many people in many different worlds. But the good news about this is that, that our, our officers are not pulling their gun during every encounter. It's not happening. And if you look at the 2020 numbers related to the use of force in terms of firearm brandishing, we did not have individual resistance response force forms, meaning use of force forms. But I suspect, looking at the numbers, that the large majority of those firearm brandishes came from the same incident, which would be the Mark, uh, the Mark Johnson shooting. So, anywho, next, and Alyssa is going to take over. I think, right, Alyssa? Yeah, before I do, I just wanted to pause just to see if the council had any questions on the data. I know we it was a whirlwind to go through that, and you have been able to um, have, you know, the more detailed slides in the report. But any questions here on the data before we go into the community engagement process? And if not, don't worry about it. It's not your last time. <laughs> we are going to have plenty of time to talk about this at the end of the presentation as well. Um, I, I just want to say, as someone who really appreciates data, I just want to thank you for uh, your time and attention and, and appreciating the, the nuance of the data. So thank you. Um, any other questions at this point? I may have more questions later, but I think for now I'm, I'm good. Others? Okay. All right, back to you all. It's all you, boss. Okay. I'm going into the community engagement pieces then. Um, so. In terms of our engagement, the Police Review Committee engaged community members through surveys, through um, multiple um, constituency-hosted non-public meetings, uh, through a public hearing, and through interviews, as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks. And we asked people, you know, what, what's your broad perspective on MPD? How would you characterize your relationship with the police department? Um, what is the department doing well? What could be improved? What have your interactions been with MPD? What went right, wrong? You know, anything that should be done differently? And what is your vision for policing? So those were the types of questions that we asked folks in, the, um, in those conversations. On a parallel track, Creative Discourse, a consultant hired by the city of Montpelier to support the development of Montpelier's equity plan, also performed community outreach through a community survey and confidential affinity groups. Um, th they included public safety and policing related questions in their outreach. And the police review committee reviewed their data as part of our, our outreach process. In total, between the police review committee and the creative discourse, we engaged approximately 550 people in this process. And in general, themes range from positive to mixed, depending on the constituency, which will which will walk through constituency um, by constituency. So, in terms of the community survey, you can see there was real a real range of responses on this side, uh, slide, characterizing uh, themes from creative discourses survey. With more than 300 people um, completing the survey. The themes range from non-police responses to, to need for training to reducing engagement with marginalized communities. We held a public hearing on April 5th, 2021, and uh, it, there were about 41 people that attended that and we shared and we heard themes on um, increasing non-police response uh, and folks got um, also more specific about concerns around use of force, a desire for accountability frameworks. Um, we also heard a desire from someone decreasing the police budget and also support from the police. So it's a spectrum of um, opinions that came out of that hearing. In terms of our individual engagement, you know, as I said, a lot of the committee members took on different areas of work and uh, engaged different constituencies. Uh, with regard to community satisfaction and the themes that came out of these conversations, 
uh, local businesses, uh, Jack, uh, Councillor um, Jack McCullough and Michael Sherman really just, they designed and delivered surveys in person to businesses. I think they handed out about 100 surveys uh, and got 31 responses. And the responses from those surveys from the local businesses really praised MPD's prompt response, professionalism, courte um, courteousness, and um, also their thoughtful interactions, as well as good communication. The overall rating the local businesses gave MPD was excellent at 76% saying that and 20% saying good or satisfactory at 4%. So really positive reviews uh, there. One request was increased foot and bicycle presence in downtown areas. MPD employees, Justin Dressler designed a survey and got input from Chief Pete that he administered to, um, to folks at MPD. There were 41 questions grouped into six categories about trust, morale, leadership, resources and training, department policies, and community. Uh, there were 24 responses. Overwhelmingly, the majority of staff were satisfied with the priorities of leadership, happy with the direction leadership is taking with MPD, and believe that leadership is acting on the best interest of the public. A majority also felt well-trained to engage with historically marginalized populations. And um, it's also worth noting that about 50% considered leaving MPD to work in another field uh, over the past year. And 12% uh, believe the community had a negative perception of MPD. In terms of affected individuals, Councillor Lauren Hurl and my and I uh, reached out to the Community Justice Center, the Vermont Network Against Domestic Violence, Circle and Mosaic to gain the perspective of affected individuals, whether they identify as victims, survivors, or affected individuals. Uh, and some of the themes that we got from that engagement were that officers are responsive, polite, helpful, respectful, and they appreciated um, MPD's ability to effectively de-escalate situations. Uh, some also um, noted that the restorative process that run by the Community Justice Center is an effective way to handle incidents and uh, an asset to the community. So those are on the most highly satisfied uh, end of the spectrum. The next bucket of groups are uh, mental health, disabilities, and, ha and housing unstable populations. Uh, Dan Powell and uh, Powell and uh, Councillor Jack McCullough did uh, did a lot of work um, with uh, the mental health and disabilities communities, engaging um, folks from Disability Rights Vermont, Vermont Center for Independent Living, Washington County Mental Health Services, and those living with. Um, you know, physical or mental uh, needs, mental health needs. From some of the themes on the mental health, uh, from the mental health community were, you know, both positive and negative experiences with MTPD, support for the addition of crisis responders, uh, peer and social work, worker resources. Uh, there were questions around whether or not the Mark Johnson shooting could have been handled differently and desire to improve screening at the first point of contact to better diagnose and respond to uh, mental health situations, as well as offering more mental health and social service training to officers. Regarding the disabilities community, we had heard similar themes on positive and negative experiences with MPD, as well as the support of additional um, crisis response peer and social work resources. We also heard uh, a desire to increase accessibility of the website, whether that be videos on how to create forms or offers to help fill out forms for folks. Uh, an update, a need to update and modernize MPD's disability policy to reflect current times and better center rights uh, and inclusion of population living with disabilities. Regarding the housing unstable community, uh, Dan, Jack, and I sought feedback from folks in another way, Good Samaritan Haven, Washington County Mental Health Services, and the Homeless Task Force. Uh, um, Don, Don Little, uh, the street outreach worker, also worked with me um, that, to do an informal survey of folks as well about how they felt my MPD was doing. And there were, there were you know, mixed feelings. Um, some see MPD as a partner, others have concerns. 
Uh, many encourage non-police response, such as peer support, street outreach, and social workers. Uh, and then some noted behaviors that really built trust, like giving rides to folks or providing flashlights or connecting people to services or assisting folks with lost items. Uh, there was requests for additional officer training and concerns around police response to opened and unopened alcoholic beverages. There was also a request for additional street outreach workers. And then the final category, more on the dissatisfied side, were um, BIPOC community members, LGBTQIA um, community members, and sex workers. And in terms of the BIPOC community uh, members, we pulled data from Creative Discourse's affinity groups uh, and also did some interview with bi interviews with BIPOC community members. Some of the themes we heard were that police can be triggering for people who are living with trauma and that BIPOC individuals have and do experience the significant trauma of overt racism, implicit bias, and microaggressions. Uh, there was interest in having a potentially having a community oversight board and changing internal police policies and practices to allow anti-racism to better take hold. LGBTQIA plus um, community members, uh, Abby German and Jen Duggan did some interviews uh, with folks with either uh, Outright Vermont, Pride Center, Rainbow Umbrella, and heard themes around the need for alternative response agencies. Uh, uh, and noting, and folks noted that transgender individuals are not recognized in Belcor data, and the way that that data is collected and um, categorized should be updated. Some did not feel safe calling 911 an emergency, and there was some support for police abolition. Uh, Abby also, Abby German also reached out to um, sex workers through the Ishtar Collaborative, the first anti-trafficking and sex workers rights organization based in Vermont, uh, and heard from people through written surveys and interviews that some felt targeted based on their identities as sex workers or afraid to call police if victimized. Concerns that past attempts to de-escalate volatile situations were unsuccessful, and a few felt that police should be abolished, and there was an increase for non-police responders. Uh, also, a request to educate law enforcement about sex work, decriminalize sex work, and demilitarize the police. We also had reached out to incarcerated and formerly incarcerated individuals, but only got one um, thorough and detailed letter from someone, which we did take into account in the data, but it really it wasn't a, a, a whole community. Um, we reached out to the folks engaged with uh, the SRO issue as well to consider data that came up in that process around youth that we should be considering in a, in a police context. So that is basically our outreach. Um, and why don't I pause here for a moment to see if you have any questions about our outreach before we move into, you know, what came of all of this from the data and the outreach where we landed on recommendations. Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Don't forget to. Yeah, sure. Uh, Melissa, when you say police abolishment, um, just, just to clarify, does that mean no, no sworn officers uh, on the force or? Yes. I mean, okay. it was essentially um, like, you know, de defunding and dismantling the police and perhaps uh, recreating a, um, a new model to, to address community safety. And it, officers might look different under, under that model, but I, it's getting rid of the current model. Any yeah. other? <laughs> okay, well, let's get into the um, recommendations and then we can drop the presentation and look at each other and chat um, if, if that is the next step here. So, Justin, why don't I turn it over to you to tackle these themes in the next couple of slides? Okay, so when we when we started making our recommendations in the PRC, we actually hadn't thought about these theme buckets. I think these themes developed over time. So individuals were just coming up with recommendations, putting them towards the committee, we debate them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera.
But as the report coalesced, it became clear that we were that all of our recommendations really could broadly be placed in one of these buckets was to increase accountability and transparency for the police, dedicate resources to non-police response, remove law enforcement from situations where their presence is unnecessary. In many situations, two and three really do dovetail so they can be jammed together in some situations because when you're removing law enforcement from situations where their presence is unnecessary, oftentimes you need re other resources that can, uh, that can support the individuals who you are trying to help. And then investments in strategies and approaches to help ensure MPD can effectively respond to community needs. We can go next, Alyssa, and you'll see where all these fit into these categories. So accountability and transparency, body-worn cameras. This is a big topic of debate on the committee, and they're one of the things the committee recognizes is there are clear costs and benefits to body-worn cameras. This is not a very simple question. Um, ultimately, we decided that the, that the benefits of body-worn cameras outweighed the costs in the sense of the privacy concerns and the fact that there isn't much evidence that body-worn cameras deter police conduct, misconduct. But if the goal isn't necessarily to deter, deter police misconduct, but necessary, but to increase accountability and transparency, we eventually decided or we voted to adopt the body worn cameras because we thought it would get us to that end. We did not take a position on budget because that is the city council's decision, but we do understand that there are really meaningful costs associated with storage and implementation of this policy. And the city council is gonna to have to cross that bridge, not us. Community engagement part protocol, I think we can, we all know that this was born of the Mark Johnson incident. And so we received a lot of a lot of feedback from the community related to the Mark Johnson shooting. And we also spoke to the police department and the city council and a number of other individuals who were involved in disseminating information related to that incident. And there appeared to be a very, very clear disconnect between some of those groups of people. And so when we, it, it became clear through a lot of our community engagement that people in the community weren't happy with the way that incident was handled from a public relations perspective and from a community engagement perspective. Um, and it could be for, don't worry, I can do it off the dome. Um, and it could be for multiple reasons. And the one of the reasons could be that the city didn't necessarily do a great job disseminating the information. We take no position on that. We don't know if that's true or not. We do not take a position on that. There are individuals that definitely do believe that. Another reason could be that the individuals who are giving this feedback just didn't weren't that information didn't reach them. It just didn't reach them. And so even if the community, even if the police department, if everyone did a great job, we just didn't reach these people because a lot of people were saying, we, where was the information? Where was it? Where was the transparency? And, and so we decided that it's important to have a community engagement protocol in place in advance. And so that's really where that comes from. Data transparency, I mean, this is an obvious one. This is where we're moving towards, I think, in general, in policing to try to make data more transparent. The recommendation here suggests that a significant amount of the data that you can access through our shared public folder that we had access to now be available to the public, more or less. I think that's the easiest way to put it because it was enlightening to read all this stuff and it would be great for the public to read it. Again, this comes at a very large cost. This is not easy to implement at all to create a public facing easy um easy access web page that you can um that you can filter through so there are costs associated with it but we thought it was best for the public to have access to this policing data next and the reason for that is again just data transparency is good and a lot of the feedback that we received was that there wasn't transparency from people who who individuals who were critical of the mpd many of the themes are related to transparency and so this just can't be a bad thing. It just can't. Next. Yeah, and having this in a user-friendly way uh, is critical for folks to have that transparency. A lot of the charts and graphs in this uh, presentation, we, we created from the raw data and it would be great for the public to have access to that through the MPD. Sure, yeah, that's a good point, Alyssa, because the raw data can be tricky sometimes. The fair and impartial policing policy, This. Essentially, our recommendation here is to that the city council should look at the fair and impartial policing policy and consider e changing it to better protect immigrant rights in situations where officers engage with immigration. I mean, that really is the, the gist of what we're looking for here. 
Militarization. This recommendation just suggests that the city council ban MPD's application for controlled equipment through the uh, 1033 program. The MPD does not participate in this program. This is prophylactic. This is not, uh, we're not trying to fix something that's broken, but we're just trying to make sure that this doesn't happen in the future. The one nuance to this particular one is that there are certain, um, certain pieces of equipment in the Department of Defense's program that have nothing to do with weaponry or anything along those lines. They're like computers and office chairs and desk chairs. And so this is written in such a way that it doesn't prevent us from participating in that part of the program, but it prevents us from participating in the, um, in the, the true military equipment part of the program. Uh, officer misconduct and internal affairs. The big one here, I guess, let me start from the bottom and work my way up. So from the bottom, there are a number of state level legislative reforms that we think the city should consider advocating for in terms of accountability and transparency and internal affairs. Uh, in terms of reviewing the internal affairs policy, it's just out of date in the sense that it's just, I mean, it's physically out of date. Whether it actually is out of date or not is to be determined, but the policy is from 2015 and Act 56 is in 2017. I would not be surprised, given how diligent the chief is, if he has already updated it and is uh, is getting it ready for public comment and review. Um, the City Council creating a Montpelier Police Advisory Committee. So the vision here with this Police Advisory Committee is to create something akin to a civilian oversight board that is not a civilian oversight board. Um, the the contract with the police union and we answer this in the public comments prevents such a board from disciplining disciplining officers in any way that is not something and i just want to be clear for anyone who's listening in the public and who has read this report it was something that was considered civilian oversight was something that was considered but we literally cannot do it based on the current contract it cannot be done and so what we have here is the Montpelier Police Advisory Committee, which would be made up of a handful of people. It would be dissimilar to the current committee because the current committee is really a, a, an exploration committee. And in that sense, it's, the advisory committee is more of an oversight committee. We do envision that committee um, reviewing allegations of misconduct and making recommendations to the city council, also making recommendations to the city council about policies and procedures that could be improved. Um, but we do not envision this to be a disciplinary body. It is not that. It cannot be that. Next, Alyssa. Okay, and so this is for me, talking about dedicated resources to non-police response and removing law enforcement when unnecessary. Uh, two primary uh, recommendations here around public drinking and street outreach. Um, this fits within, um, I want to, I want to, explain these a little bit more because the city's current ordinance around um, public drinking intersects with state law um, in police issuing citations or making re re arrests related to public drinking becomes more involved and complicated and time-consuming process. Uh, sometimes it means bringing the accused individual to a detox facility or, and, or if there's not capacity there, taking individual um, into protective custody, all of which consumes a lot of time and keeps the officer uh, unavailable to respond to emergency calls for service. So with regard to our recommendations here, we were looking at how the current ordinance around public drinking disproportionately affects the unhoused um, and individuals with mental health problems. Police actions um, to compel compliance with state law around like open containers and public drinking frequently result in escalation of resistance and use of force, which then results in criminal charges. Uh, in addition, sometimes local detox facilities don't have capacity. So we were hearing and learning that intoxicated individuals are then transported significant distances like Montpelier to Burlington often without their belongings, and then they're left there to, you know, to find their way back to Montpelier the next day. Um, and that can create really challenging situations. So in addition to this um, ordinance not being related to, to criminal behavior, but literally being related to you know, open, open containers um, and public drinking, the courts have also deprioritized this type of offense. So 12 citations were issued by MPD around public drinking in 2020, and all were dismissed by the court. So 
that is why our recommendation is to have MPGG prioritize, you know, non-criminal um, public drinking, which often involves the unhoused community, and instead move to adding street outreach worker capacity to help help backfill that support, and then any public drinking related issue that was connected to criminal behavior would, of course, continue to go to them. But this is really looking at non-criminal related drink, uh, not a response to non-criminal um, drinking, essentially. I want, I'll talk a little bit more about these two as well. So the social worker and peer support resources Montpelier's co-response model uh, that exists now is very new, having been approved and instituted, you know, just within the last two years. And this response so far has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, the committee, the the sorry, the community, the committee received feedback from both the community and the MPD that they would like to see more co-response. However, because the social worker is shared between MPD and Barry City. Um, provided through Washington County Mental Health Services. Additional co-response is you know, currently impossible without more resources. So MPD leadership and the mental health unhoused stakeholders also called for integration of peer support workers as part of the mental health crisis response team. The use of peer support workers in addition to social workers in, and utilizing those workers in crisis response um, in other cities across the country has proven to be very successful. And it is done at a significantly lower cost as well. So we believe these resources will help really fortify the current co-response model that MPD has. With regard to sex work, MPD, this, the recommendation asks that MPD deprioritize sex work between consenting adults and continue to maintain focus on human trafficking, coercion, underage, and forced sex. The issue was brought to our attention by a vocal minority. Uh, we looked at the data and it showed that when sex work is criminalized, workers experience more violence and are more likely to be victimized and are less likely to report a crime. In Montpelier, though sex work may not be obvious, it is happening, confirmed by an informal survey done by the Ishtar Collaborative and by Chief Pete. Um, we believe that these recommendations will remove a barrier to accessing police services and will improve the health and safety of a small vulnerable population in the community. This uh, has also been an issue statewide with the AG criminalization bill proposed in 2020. That bill did not pass but a Good Samaritan bill did pass, granting limited immunity to sex workers who are victims or witnesses of a crime. The law shields both sex workers and their clients from being prosecuted on certain charges connected to their involvement in sex work. So, Sam, why don't I turn it over to you for this, and then we'll move into the public comments. Sure. So we're going to move pretty quickly through this, because essentially what we have here is just, I, I want to start with training first. Now, you know what, let me do officer recruitment first because it's on top anyway. So the, there's a recommendation to increase the minimum requirements for the officers. This one was also hotly debated. The MPD is having, well, I don't want to speak for the chief, but um, I think it's fair to say that the MPD is having difficulty recruiting officers. And so adding any additional barriers to officer recruitment is potentially problematic. Nevertheless, we thought it was best to add these um, these the additional requirements that we've laid out here primarily to ensure the hope is to create a more well-rounded police force and a police force that is a little bit more engaged in the community. Now we have here a minimum of one year of post-secondary education or equivalent life and or internship experience. We got some public feedback that we should require post-secondary education and that was discussed at length on the during the police review committee and at the end of the day, um, the majority decided that such a policy would be classist and that it would be limiting a number of different individuals from applying for this type of work. And there, I think we all know that people come from all sorts of different backgrounds and have all sorts of different access to education and whether one having one year of post-secondary education um, trumps equivalent life experience, I think is very, very debatable. And that's why, that's why we landed here. But the goal here is just to create a more well-rounded police force 
be a little more life experience. It's already tough. You know, we thought about raising the minimum requirement to being 21 years or older, 25 years or older, because of all the adolescent uh, brain development science that's out there. But again, that just adds another barrier. And then there were concerns from the police department that like, that, you know, maybe you do have someone who is 19, 20 years old, who's wonderful, who couldn't possibly be better. And so we didn't want to paint with too broad a brush. With regard to training, um, again, the committee is aware of all of the community feedback related to increasing the police budget. And this training could theoretically increase the police budget. However, some of the feedback we got related to how officers have engaged with youth in certain circumstances and have engaged in um, sorry with crowds during certain protests or events on the state house lawn led us to believe that it was probably bet that it was best for some specific youth based training to be included in the officer training and for the officers to receive more training on crowd control and there's a lot more detail in these these are michael's recommendations and whenever michael wrote a recommendation you can be sure that there is going to be a huge amount of detail when you click the link so please do click the link because you're going to have pages and pages and pages that i that are wonderful that i had to cut for the report um, in terms of scenario-based training it's just best practice when we say scenario-based training we mean doing the exact opposite of what we're doing right here and it's just best practice and so the chief agrees, everybody agrees, this is a non-controversial idea, except insofar as it might increase the budget. And Alyssa, I think we can move on. Public comments, you know, there, Alyssa, I'm not sure we have to talk too much about public comments because we did talk about a number of them along the way. The public comments, I would say, so we've solicited these public comments for a two week period. Essentially, we released a draft version of the report, which was very, very similar to the report that we have, that you have in front of you and that was ultimately released. We did change some things specifically in response to public comments by comments that we didn't necessarily things that we didn't necessarily think through. Um, we advertised the we advertised on the face, city's Facebook page, front port form, times, the bridge, an online comment form, paper comment forms, drop boxes. We tried to reach far and wide. Dan was um, was very adamant that we made sure that we that the broadest possible group of people got to read and comment on this report. We received 15 comments, some of them quite lengthy, some of them a bit short. And, um, and you know, I, we have all of the comments linked to in the report. I tried to just um, glean a few of them that were, uh, that were representative of the whole and answer them after the conclusion of the report. In some instances, people were asking us to do things that we can't do, like disband the police union. In some instances, people were asking us to do things that we had thought of doing, but ultimately decided not to. In some instances, people were asking us to do things um, that maybe weren't necessarily best suited for us to do. So for example, there was one particular commenter who, who had mentioned the accumulation of micro traumas for police, which is something that I think a lot of these committees don't necessarily look into. They don't think about it from the other perspective. It's very easy to think about it from the perspective of like, police are bad, how do we change the police? when in fact the police mental health is a, a very real issue in this country and across the world um, that was something that we, we just know from talking to the chief that it's like at the top of his priority list so it's just there's no reason for us to get into that and so that's what the comments fell into it was usually stuff that we either either we couldn't do wasn't really in our purview or in a couple of instances we, you know we thought it was really good feedback that we wanted to incorporate into the report so there we are unless you have anything to add there yeah, no, just said, um, I think we can um, just bring this home here and then open it up because I see we have a hand. But I wanted to just uh, oh, let you know that we did work really closely with the city. We appreciated their support every step of the way and with MPD around providing the information. And then this, this slide just shows the positions that the city took on the different um, recommendations that we put forward. Uh, and moving forward, um, we we were asked moving forward what to do, you know, in terms of next steps. So we would we would love to see early action on the areas where there's alignment between, uh, you know, city staff and um, the police review committee, and then you know, of course, create some public engagement around that, but also then allow for additional and deeper discussion on ones that. Uh, where that is also warranted. 
Um, we also would recommend a future committee continue to look in these issues and others. And this, um, this document, this presentation will be available online for folks who are looking for the rest of the slides and, you know, to get more detailed with them. But why don't we open it up now? I know we've been here for a long time chatting. So why don't we just open it up and um, Mayor Watson, I'll hand it back to you and end the show. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I just want to thank the committee for their uh, incredible work on this document. It is uh, so professional and, and well presented and uh, I think it's going to be fodder for uh, some really good discussion. Uh, and we're, I'm just so grateful for uh, your, um, your diligence in uh, this task. And even though, you know, we, we said, maybe could you have it by, you know, the middle of summer, I, I'm grateful that uh, we have such a, a thorough report here, even though it's, it's October, that's perfectly fine. Um, so, uh, so again, uh, so um, we're going to jump to clarifying questions. Um, if you don't understand something or need something to be um, clarified uh, with the council, we're going to do that. And so uh, Morgan and Zach, I see your hands. If you can hold your, your thoughts or comments, don't forget it. Um, we'll get there in, in just a second. Um, clarifying questions. If there's none, that's okay. Uh, Connor. They saw it like Burlington's been talking a lot about, you know, right sizing the police department up there. Just to be clear, this committee did not come up with a number of what is the right amount of officers to have or if we need an increase, a decrease. It's we didn't. I will tell you, um, Councillor Casey, Connor, I don't know what I'm supposed to call you. Um, <laughs> the, uh, that is a hard question. That is a really, really, really hard question. And I would say within a week of me joining the committee, we think we realized that that was a question that we probably weren't going to be able to answer because each community has different needs and each community is distinct in many different ways. And I will say that we saw no evidence that there are far too many or far too few police officers in Montpelier. Um, we didn't see that evidence. And I, you know, I'm saying that we, there's no suggestion that we are on one extreme or another. Um, I think arguments could be made and probably will be made that we are uh, we're too far in one direction or too far in the other direction but no it's just it's not a um it's just not that simple you know what i mean it's just not that simple and it's especially hard in a small town if you want 24-hour coverage um, i have one question which could either be um, for you or for the chief um, the trainings that are recommended in this report I, I got the sense that those are not trainings that we currently do. I just wanted to confirm that that is true. Chief can answer that. I think in some instances, the answer is we already do some of this type okay. of training and we're just asking for more of it, but I, Chief, you're better equipped than me. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council. Good evening, Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, folks. Before I start, I'd like to really put out there that the PRC were an extraordinarily engaged group. They asked a lot of tough questions and they asked a lot of rightful questions and, and, and their heart and their passion was really easy to see. They were extraordinarily good to work with and they were critical, They were, but they were constructively critical. Um, so I view that as, as, as an allyship of what we did they brought a lot of insight to us um so and and they stepped up at a time that the community was asking for and they volunteered a lot of time so i just want to make that announcement um how appreciative the department is for what they've done and for helping us to give you know more of a north star to the direction that we want to go and to validate what we're looking at as far as our strategic planning uh in answering your question ma'am uh yes the department does some form of training but we would like to do more so as we're looking at those types of training opportunities, some of them could be budget neutral for us. I think a lot of them could because we have partnerships uh, with subject matter experts all across the, the country. And we also have a local pool of folks in the community that have reached out to us, whether phone or email, volunteering their services to provide training to the department. Thank you very much. Um, 
<laughs> okay, other, uh, uh, Jennifer, if this was covered or not, um, I'm just wondering as far as like human trafficking, are there plans um, for human trafficking, uh, like part of the department? Is that happening? I guess my question is, do you is know? human trafficking happening? No, uh, like a committee or a group is, is work being done on human trafficking? In Montpelier. I, I, I suppose the chief could uh, could answer that question. I I'm not going to answer for the chief. Chief, sorry, boss. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We are. We're part of the Vermont State Human Trafficking Task Force. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Any other clarifying questions at this point? Donna, go ahead. When you were uh, speaking to Connor's question about right sizing, we've had several reports from consultants saying at various times, right size, right size. And particularly as a state capital, and yet we have a lot of overtime. So if indeed the community is asking for more police services, that overtime might be reduced if some of the non-criminal incidents move to another kind of response. Is Do you feel the overtime would be better addressed if we kept the, the police the same size but directed some of these incidents to a better resource to address them you would get rid of some overtime it's a really complicated question um i mean the chief can answer that but i mean you're talking yeah chief go for it uh i think that there is a uh it depends type of an answer um some of the training so if we're looking at sending officers and staff members to various types of training we're going to need folks to cover their shifts uh to make that availability and then if we then, then if there are other agencies that the, that that will handle certain calls for service that the department will no longer do the city council will have to look at funding those positions as well so it i think it ultimately depends on the situation and i think um, at the end of the day there's at the end of the day the city and this police department need to decide what the appropriate amount of staffing at any given time in terms of sworn officers is how many officers do you want on in that moment? And that's where this whole thing starts. Because once, because from there, everything flows. Because it's just math. If you want three officers on at all times, you have a minimum department size, unless somebody's working, 80, everybody's working 80 hours a week. And so that's where the discussion needs to start. And then you can move back and move forward from there. And that is the hard question. Thank you. Um, go ahead, follow as a follow-up. When you talked about the police uh, body cameras, I agreed with your statements that it seems there's no proof as far as, and I wish to, maybe you could go over your own wording. You were saying there wasn't data that really showed they worked to reduce crime, to reduce incidents. I can't remember your language. Sure. Yeah, there is there is a little evidence at this point to suggest that body-worn cameras deter police misconduct insofar oh. as they don't prevent yeah. police from doing bad things however they record it what they do is they record a lot of things there's also some criticism that well you know officers don't necessarily always turn them on they don't you know they don't necessarily follow the procedures that you should be the best practices with body-worn cameras body-worn cameras only provide one limited perspective if you ever look through a camera you can see yeah. that you have a small yeah. window that you're looking through these are all fair and reasonable criticisms all of them um but you'll yeah. see in the report that the aclu vermont and the aclu generally have developed a framework of, of policies and procedures for using body-worn cameras that they think will maximize accountability and transparency and a, as a criminal defense attorney i can tell you that i always want the footage 100, 100 times out of 100 i want the footage i know that some people think that that's not true that like all defendants are guilty it, you always want the footage because the worst version of anything that you're ever going to see for your client is the police report because that is told from the perspective of the police um and that and again like you are always the hero of your own story i'm not i don't say that to uh as as a slight yeah. to the police you are the hero of your own story so i always want the different perspective and that was what really drove me to support this but again huge cost i mean it's the, you're talking about the cost of a street outreach worker to put body worn cameras on everybody so and i really appreciate that was there any data on attitude thing that bothers me the most is attitude. Was there any data on the change of community attitude between police and the community because of cameras? I can't answer it. 
Okay, no. Well, I could if I were smarter, okay. but I can't answer. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Lauren and then Alyssa. I see you've got your hand up, so I'm going to go in that order. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure Alyssa could weigh in. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. Uh, Alyssa, <laughs> go ahead. not anymore, Alyssa. Yeah, no, I just was hoping to try to answer um, one of the questions that was coming up, which is, I, uh, you know, you were talking about the size of police force earlier. I think um, Councillor Casey was talking about that. Maybe Councillor Bates was all, was also talking about that. And um, one thing that was very clear, though we didn't get to a specific number, and as Justin said, we're not out of whack when you look at the ratios, you know, or numbers of our police forces versus similarly sized. One thing that was very clear from the community was a uh, um, interest in dedicating resources to non-police responses whenever you could. Like if you if it wasn't a violent crime matter, if there wasn't a missing person, like if it wasn't a criminally oriented response that was necessary, the thinking was shift it to social worker, peer response, you know, to support you know folks in mental suffering from mental health crises and for street outreach workers around helping the unhoused. So that was a, just a true theme. And I just want to be clear about that because the fullest application of that theme, you know, might impact the way that staffing, uh, you know, occurs. And that is something for the council to ultimately consider um, if you took that to the fullest extent. Um, yes, go ahead. If, if I may, so it, it, just just a, just a quick nugget. So when when looking at personnel staffing for police agencies, there's often a standard formula that's used that's based on training needs, uh, calls for service, and and, and everything. It, it's uh, so I can bring that formula up, but in, in looking at just normal regular staffing based on well, not regular staffing, but just based on what staffing looks like. Uh, across the nation, the FBI releases those types of data numbers in Vermont or the Montpelier's in the center based on the the like the nighttime population of a population of 7,200. But then there are other issues that you look at when it balloons to to the daytime weekday. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other clerk? Go ahead, Connor. Just a social worker positions. Um, I think I recommended adding 1.5. I was curious, we're sharing it with Barry now, uh, with the thought that it's better just embedded in the MPD, or is there a benefit in sharing it between the two communities, which do serve similar populations sometimes? Uh, in terms of the benefit of embedding, I'll, answer, I'll let the chief answer that. But just to be clear, the social worker position was social worker or a combination of social worker and street outreach workers, and that it was very important to one of our committee members um, insofar as the street outreach workers have been found to be more effective in a number of different circumstances. Um, I'm sorry, did I say straight outreach workers? I meant peer support worker is what I meant. So peer support workers have found, found, been found to be more effective than individuals who are necessarily associated with the police department and are better at de-escalating. And there's just all sorts of evidence that, the, that they could be more effectively used. So that isn't totally answering your question. But yeah, I, I think we would, I think the committee would prefer to see the social worker embedded with the MPD, I know there's an office space issue. There's all sorts of issues surrounding it, but you know. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with the executive board of, of CIT International. Uh, CIT International position in, in mind humbly is that um, that there is a partnership less than an embedded social worker position. So even though in some communities, based on resources or availability of resources, that it may make more sense to have uh, a social worker that's actually embedded with the department. Um, but I'm of the position that it may behoove us because Washington County Mental Health Services has been doing has had this partnership with MPD for over 20 years. And they've been so a lot of folks are talking about the cahoots model in Oregon. Washington County has been doing this as well. So I think there's a pride in what Vermont has been doing that's not seldom recognized. Um, and what a gem that we have with Washington County here. I, I am in con contact and conversations with Gary Gordon and Mary Moulton to see what that might look like to bring that information forward to the council if the council is interested in, in seeing what that might look like or what their preference as the experts are. But I also want to let, uh, let folks know that there are a lot of calls for service related to mental health or behavioral health issues that don't even make it to the police department that go straight to Washington County Mental Health Services as well. And, and actually, let me just add a little bit to that, uh, Councillor Bay, give me half a second. So I suppose I was um, 
when I was answering that question, we actually don't envision a fully embedded social worker in so far as necessarily um, part of the police department. We envision it similar to what it is right now, where that social worker would be contracted out with a mental health services provider like WCMHS. And I can't remember the second point, but it was important. Oh, with regard to, oh, damn, Chief. All right, <laughs> Councilor B. Oh, no. relate. Okay, because Jack also has his hand up, but okay, this, if, if it relates, this, go ahead. Yeah. The report actually says add 1.5, and that's to the half social worker we have plus the peer support, right? We're adding, and that's what the recommendations are. Yes, the okay. uh, the 1.5 is a combination of social worker and peer support worker, if I'm remembering the... the... Yeah, but it, it's added to the two, mm -hmm. two positions we now have, but not full time. The two positions we now have. You we, mean, we the, now you have mean a Susan, half the, the social worker, and we have a peer... Oh, your support. Well, Donna's a street outreach, outreach worker, so there's a yeah, difference. Yeah, outreach worker. It's a little different. Yeah. And if I also may let the council know that there is a CIT steering committee that includes, um, uh, yes, the crisis intervention team. And uh, so there is a CIT steering committee team that has already been stood up. And um, Kareem from Psychic Survivors, Dr. Deppman, uh, the Berlin police chief, uh, James Pompriand, um, Joe Allsworth, uh, we have um, Kristen too. Um, Kristen Chandler. Yes, Kristen Chandler is. So she and Mark Deppman are kind of like co chairs of it. So the CIT steering committee is basically um, voices of the entire community. Uh, Gary Gordon's also on that. So that CIT team is going to look at what the response model, have a recommended response model based on fire, EMS. Uh, Washington County Mental Health Service, police, the entire gambit, uh, homeless outreach, uh, folks um, who are with Circle, folks who are with uh, just, just the entire range within the community, what should a response model look like? Look at having dispatch divert resources based on that and then incoming with the new 988 system. So um, I would be, be remiss to telling you that probably I anticipate standing up an actual CIT program uh, in Montpelier within the next, uh, probably our first training within the next three or four months. Um, Jack, and then if it's okay with folks, I'd like to get to public comment. Um, okay, go ahead. Thank you. I just following up on the questions that have been being raised. Um, I think it's fair to say that the uh, committee for the most was more interested in making sure we had enough of a resource for of uh, social work and uh, and peer uh, advocate personnel than quibbling about whether it's going to how much it's going to be here it's going to be shared between between here and barry the bigger question that i think we were mostly addressing was do we have enough to meet the need and uh, it's it's very clear from our review of the activities of the montpelier police department that there's a whole lot of if, if people think that uh, the police are rolling out every time there's anything that looks like a mental health crisis that is far from the case in Montpelier that there's a lot there's already non-police response okay um, unless there's any other burning clarifying questions I'm going to move to um, Mayor Watson, so yes. sorry to interrupt. Okay. I want to just clarify the numbers that we were just saying, because I'm just, I just want to make sure we're just clear on the numbers of FTEs we're talking about in these two different situations, and then happy to just open it up. But the additional social worker and peer support resources would add 1.5 FTEs, and that is based off of um, the need that we saw essentially um, from the calls coming in and conversations with the department and the, the that those what I just talked about the additional 1.5 FTEs is are to, to address mental health needs the street outreach worker to focus on the unhoused community um, would be adding an additional, and I believe I think this is very confusing in the way we wrote it, and so I totally own this, but it would be adding capacity to equal 1.5 FTEs total. 
So it would basically be taking Don's time plus another FTE and together they would be 1.5 FTEs. So that's the difference in those numbers and just wanted to be clear about that and happy to hear from the public. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, Jack. We haven't thought we're approaching our standard 8.30 uh, break time. Yeah. I wonder if it might make sense to take a break now rather than break up the uh, discussion. Um, we could do that. Um, I, I you have a preference. Yeah, yeah um, I, I guess I'd, well, I'd prefer to, to at least start if that's okay. And then we might have to take a break um, in the middle of public comment. Um, but yeah, what I'd like to do is I, I wanna start with uh, Abby since they had their hand up um, before the meeting even began. And then uh, we'll go to Morgan and then Zach and then Don. Um, after that, I'm gonna prioritize people who are here in person. Um, if any, anyone in person wants to make a comment and then we'll go back to um, folks who may be with us uh, digitally. So, uh, and but just as a heads up to everybody, um, we're gonna try to take a break around 8.30. Okay. Um, all right, uh, Abby, go ahead. Um, in honor of Indigenous Peoples Day um, two days ago, and in light of um, the land acknowledgement, which was actually not acknowledged today in our um, vocalization of the report, I'd just like to read uh, the acknowledgement that I wrote. So, the Police Review Committee acknowledges that our work was done on the unceded land of the Abenaki people. This land was stewarded by the Abenaki people for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans to Turtle Island. The Abenaki people's relationship with this land predates the formation of the city of Montpelier, Washington County, the state of Vermont, and the United States of America. The genocide, destructive resource extraction, and land theft that European colonizers use against the indigenous population are serious crimes against humanity. Today, indigenous people are still forcibly removed from their lands, targeted for violence, and criminalized at disproportionate rates. The city of Montpelier currently has no policies or practices that strengthen settler and indigenous relations, support indigenous sovereignty, return land, or otherwise uplift the Abenaki people. We urge the city to commit to policies and practices that go beyond simply acknowledging the original peoples. In a nation founded in genocide, racism, and land theft, we must pursue their antitheses, anti-racism, indigenous knowledge and leadership, and returning land to indigenous peoples. Thank you. That I was also uh, thinking about that uh, that was an, an important part of the um, the report. So thank you. Um, all right, uh, Morgan, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Morgan W. Brown, and <clears throat> I'm a Montpelier resident in District 3. Listening to the Police Review Committee report presentation and mention about concerns regarding the shooting death of Mark Johnson, it came to mind and is my observation as well as opinion that all the justifications and excuses employed in defense of the police aside, he essentially was perceived as a monster and was put down as if he was a rabid animal. Mark Johnson was not a monster, nor a rabid animal. And he, as well as the community, deserve, deserved much better, my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, Zach, go ahead. Um, my, my internet might cut it out, hopefully it doesn't. Uh, I just would like to thank. Oh no! Oh no! You just cut out. 
That is unfortunate. Um, you know, if um, oh, it looks like he is frozen potentially. Um, we'll just a tremendous partner. Um, and I just want to point out a couple things tonight. I, I think it's easy to say we're not going to respond to non-violent uh, situations. Um, I'm concerned that when this was rolled out, because it has been rolled out, the MPD will not respond to certain situations. And we've been told what those are. Um, but unfortunately, prior, we were not informed of that. So in my work, in my training, when I have a client who is out of control and I call for help and I'm told, oh, call the screeners for that. And we're told in our training to call MPD, which we did. And we're told differently as a client is out of control uh, because a group of people have said, let's not respond to certain situations. I think that in the future, if you're gonna do that, um, if you're gonna make a major policy shift, please let your partners know um, because it's not fair that my fellow staff got things thrown at them and we were told, oh, we're not responding because you need to call screeners for that. And I think that people sitting on these committees need to understand what is really at stake. Plus, we rarely call you for help. So I just want to be very clear. It's my last resort to call the police department in for help. On the same token, I appreciate Chief Pete for meeting with Gary Gordon and my director, Keith Greer. And we worked it out and I am training my workers now with my supervisor to react differently. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Zach, I want you to know that um, your comments cut out there uh, just before, <laughs> between the point when you said I might cut out and then um, you were you were just saying, I want to point out um, uh, th this, this point about calling um, screeners versus the um, Montpelier Police Department. If you wanted to backtrack to what the first part of your comment was, I want to make sure. Uh, what I what I just want to say is just basically the issue of just shifting to a non-police response is not enough for me. I think you need to notify your partners that you're going to do that, and that we are expected to do something different because it's just not okay. I I think. Before Chief Pete came along, we had this expectation. They came out, they helped us. It was a partnership. And suddenly we're left with someone throwing things at us and or being out of control. And at least two or three situations, response was not properly given. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, I wanna just point out it is uh, 8 30. Uh, Don, you are up next, and uh, I'm hoping that you can hang on to your thought until we get back. Is that okay? Um, that, that's fine with me. That's great. Okay, great. Um, so we are going to take our standard 10 minute break, um, and so we'll meet back at um, 8 41 about. Uh, all right. Cool. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> I have enough time to eat a little bit or something. Oh, we're almost all back here. A minute early even. No, it's okay. I, I am going to eat a little bit here though. Mmm, I know, right? <laughs> but that... <laughs> Hmm. 
All right, we are all back, and it is 8.41. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Don, and then after Don, I'm going to check with folks in person if there's anyone who would like to make a comment who's here. And then we'll go back to uh, taking comments from folks digitally. Uh, Don, go ahead. Thank you. Um, apologies if I'm being redundant, but I can't see the the paper or the recommendations. Um, just wanted to comment on two things. One, regarding the potential requirement for increased post-secondary education for police officers. I think that would be a huge mistake. You probably already said that, but I feel that um, strongly that targeted training would be a much better approach and would not eliminate qualified people. Um, so perhaps targeted training in de-escalation, trauma, awareness of marginalized populations, and preventing officer burnout would be a lot more helpful than some kind of degree. Um, the other thing is, although I hate to mention it, what I've seen recently is possibly because of the changing conditions in the unhoused population, seeing a bit more violence out there. And I feel like... Um, we need more street outreach, both for safety and effectiveness. We are working more closely with the police recently, but I think that whatever additional support, I do think we can reduce the time wastage and expense of officer response to non-criminal situations. But I do think that since a lot of the concerning incidents are likely to occur off hours, that an embedded social worker I don't know if, if you do ever have social workers that go out with the police after hours, but I do think that whoever responds, there's a greater need for after hours and geographically flexible responses rather than somebody in an office. So whether it's additional police, additional peer or street outreach, we need more street outreach and we need more people who can respond where people are physically and after hours. Um, and just as a minor point, current street outreach is also peer outreach. Thank you. Um, Don, can I ask you a question about that? Could you clarify for us, and maybe this is also a question for other people too, but could you clarify the difference between a street outreach worker and a, a peer support? I'm, the peers both, well, street outreach is an unbelievably broad term and what it actually is depends on who's doing it and who is hiring them to do it. Um, it also changes in response to needs, which change a lot. I guess my feeling is that peer, peer support can either be approached in a non-hierarchical manner by someone who has lived experience or at least training in it's kind of a more, it's a more hierarchical, less goal-oriented approach where you are depending a lot more on, on relationship and trust, which really works wonders with de-escalation. It's slightly, it can be more goal-oriented, but it's, it's often used to describe people with lived experience in, in the situation, the type of situations that exist in the population we're dealing with. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but it's just, it's a really broad, it's a very broad term. Not all street outreach is peer support. Not all peer support is street outreach. I feel like when you can, when they overlap, that's really, that's really useful. Um, because if you're dealing with really marginalized populations who are disillusioned, have major trauma and mental health issues, they often respond a lot better to somebody who's perceived as a peer in some way than they do to the system, which many people have been, have a great distrust of and may have had bad experiences with. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, it, it may involve training in, in peer support models, which, which I have, which not everybody has, but, and it may not be essential for everyone, but it sometimes involves training in methods of communication with people. And sometimes it's, you know, like I said, it's, it's flexible. Okay, thank you. All right, so from here, I want to uh, just check in with folks who are present uh, with us for the meeting. Uh, would anybody like to make a comment? Uh, yes. 
So again, if you'd say your name, where you live, and uh, try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you for letting me join you tonight. I appreciate the time that you're giving me to, to speak out. And, and if you could I get right a, up close to the microphone, I do, too. Maybe I need to tip it. You may, yes. <laughs> I do ask that you enter this information into your record. My name is Maggie Karen. I'm speaking as a Vermont Chair for New Englanders Against Sexual Exploitation. And what I'd like to do is read a short transcript from a little video called The Oldest, um, the Oldest Oppression. So, see if I can read through the fog of my glasses, right? So, I'm going to be naming people who are speaking short parts in this, and the first person is Trisha Grant, speaking as a survivor. And she writes, when I was being, well, in the video, when I was being trafficked in Vermont, I was a minor. I was 15 years old. And every time when I was in my home in Maine, and I knew that they were going to be that we were going to be brought to Vermont, I became frightened because it was the one place where I knew I would be brought and I never knew if I was going to end up coming home or not. The people who purchased me, none of them cared about me, none of them cared about who I was or how old I was, or if I wanted to be there, they had an agenda which sometimes can be brutally violent. I know that other survivors that I've mentored and work with have been brought to Vermont in many areas, homes, hotels, motels, massage parlors, strip clubs, bachelor parties. I can honestly say that 100% of the women that I've worked with, and I've worked with close to 1,000 people, I have not personally met even one person who said that they wanted to be there and that this is empowering for them or exciting or something they love doing, not one. Next is the Executive Director for the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women who says, when you're talking about prostitution, you're talking about a system of brutal exploitation. Then from prostitution and trafficking survivor, associate director, my life, my choice. The women that I encountered, they are so beaten, so traumatized. Another prostitution and trafficking survivor from a Rebecca speaks out. The vast majority have been abused, manipulated, forced into it, or they're trapped by circumstance. National Director for World Without Exploitation. Those who are being bought are women and girls of color who are mostly poor. Prostitution and trafficking survivor, peer mentor advocate, RIA House. I was turned out when I was 14 years old. Every time I tried to run away, there was no resources for me. Not a day that I've ever spent in the life of prostitution was okay for me. Somebody who's unnamed said 99% of the buyers are men. Director of Intervention, Intervention, Exodus Cry, says you can't fully achieve equality between men and women while there is this gender-based form of exploitation. Co-founder, Organization for Prostitution Survivors, says the problem originates with men, so unless we tackle the is issue of demand, there's going to be generation after generation of vulnerable populations who are hurt in precisely this way. CEO of Child Safe. Every single policymaker needs to go to a hobby board where these buyers congregate and read what they have to say. Time and again, they are demonstrating that what they feel they're buying is a commodity, not a human being. The senior deputy prosecuting attorney for King County, Washington, says a lot of men are deterred from engaging in prostitution because it's illegal. And if you were to take that illegality out of the equation, you would have an increase in demand. In order to meet that demand, you would have a supply that would need to increase. Vice President of Agri Advocacy and Outreach at the National Center on Sex Sexual Exploitation says a study from the London School of Economics analyzed 150 countries. Wherever prostitution was legal, demand for it skyrocketed and sex trafficking increased. Prostitution and trafficking survivor Rebecca Speaks Out says, I was actually trafficked through the legal system of prostitution in Nevada, in the brothels. And because of that legal market, the sex trade in Nevada is 63% higher than the next highest state. Co-founder from Awaken says, Nevada is number two in the country for women to be murdered by men, number six in the country for women to be raped by men, and the top 10 for youth to be trafficked. Professor from University of Rhode Island says, Rhode Island decriminalized prostitution in 1980 and then ended it in 2009. It was becoming a sex tourist destination. It started attracting, attracting organized crime. And because the local law enforcement simply couldn't investigate prostitution, 
the state could not participate in federal investigations of sex trafficking of minors. And then unnamed, legalization, full decriminalization, these have been tried and these have failed. Both remove restriction on pimps, sex buyers, and brothel keepers, especially full decriminalization, decriminalization where are there virtually no regulations so they can exploit without they can exploit with immunity. And then another unnamed says, so if you're considering legalizing prostitution, my message is talk to survivors of tra trafficking. Talk to people who have walked through this. Talk to people who have experienced this firsthand, not just people who are advocating for decriminalization. And finally, the last unnamed, people say it's the oldest profession. It's actually the oldest oppression. And I would just leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would. I'd be happy to. I see it right to your manager and he can distribute. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michael Shively. I'm also with the New England Mothers Against Sexual Exploitation. Uh, for the past 30 years, I've been a full time researcher and focused on evaluating criminal justice uh, policies and, and practices. And for 20 years, I've had a series of, uh, of uh, studies funded by the federal government looking at exactly this issue of sex work, sexual exploitation, prostitution, whatever you want to call it. And uh, uh, while I applaud the, the committee's work to, you know, get as much information as you can, there really actually was very little real data or real research informing the recommendation to fully decriminalize uh, prostitution. Uh, I'm more than happy to drown you in I, my bibliography's got over 30,000 sources in it, you know, so you're, you're welcome to it. But I just want you to consider a few things. Uh, what is being proposed here is just to take the most dangerous way you can make money. And that's, that's without question. It is the most dangerous way you can earn money. And it's from 17 to 100 times more dangerous than number two on the list. And then the solution is to fully deregulate it. Absolutely no regulations of any kind, right? No health, no safety, no licensing, no competency, no oversight, nothing. Fully decriminalizing prostitution would allow any home, any apartment, any nail salon to become a brothel. And there's nothing you can do about it because exchanging for money for sex is not against the law if this ordinance were to pass. Um, I'll leave you with one other thought. Um, uh, you talked about getting community you know, feedback. I interviewed 47 convicted sex traffickers that were in federal prison for a, a different project. With 22 of them, we had conversation about decriminalizing prostitution. And I asked the question, would it have been better or easier for you to be a sex trafficker, to traffic human beings, if prostitution were decriminalized fully, or would you prefer it to remain criminalized? The typical response was to laugh and to say, you've got to be kidding me. That's a stupid question. The answer is so obvious. And I said, well, tell me anyway. 100% of convicted sex traffickers would prefer to operate in an environment where there are no prohibitions against prostitution. So I really want to ask you to consider whether giving sex traffickers the policy of their dreams is something you really want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Seth Collins. I live in Berlin, Vermont, and uh, I I would have to agree with what has already been said. Is that, uh, in my opinion, prostitution is sort of like a warning sign that there is often often some type of predatory dynamic or some type of trafficking under the surface. It may not be in the specific incident. But but there is still there's still often you know there's still often something something that is that it's what it is is to listen to, for the untold story. Thanks so much. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I want to commend the amount of work that went into it. Uh, I attended a number of the meetings, but 
I want to caution that due to the makeup of the committee, which I think was uh, selected with uh, possibly a predetermined narrowing of the, but of the opportunity for critical analysis. Uh, analysis of current police practice. Having been in this town over 30 years and had police officers steal from me, lie, lie to me, lie to the court, uh, and steal beer from, you know, defenseless homeless people, unopened beers, harass grieving attorneys uh, who are drinking a beer and gr grieving with their friends on private property. No, and then have a chief subvert an, a, a Vermont State Police investigation into the shooting of Mark Johnson. It is none of this made it into the report. I mean, th this type of accountability and an acknowledgement of what has gone wrong has to be the foundation of building, rebuilding trust. So this, this report, while it does have some useful insight and analysis, it falls far short of what we need right now. This community is is divided over the garage, is divided over the Mark Johnson shooting, and we're still pretending that everything's just fine and we can just keep barreling along. But for, we, it's, I hate to pop your little bubble. Uh, current police practice requires an acknowledgement of theft, deceit, harassment, uh, subverted investigation. Chad being responsible for two different deaths, one where he broke somebody's arm who died soon thereafter and breaking somebody's ribs in an overreaction to a, a child smoking pot, you know? So it, these, these three incidents didn't give a warning flag that maybe this guy shouldn't have a gun. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I hate to interrupt you, but that's a false statement. Just made. Yeah, you say a lot of false statements. No, that's a false statement that Mr. Bean broke anyone's ribs in relation to a pot smoking incident. And if you're going to come in here and continue to make false statements. I've got the records from the police department documenting that, Mr. Look, you look at that and see which call it was. I've got the backup if y'all need it. And it, I'm glad that you put yourself on the line there when you didn't have your facts straight. Uh, this report is really blind to the work that has been going on with regionalization of services, that much of this new paradigm of what they're calling reinventing 911. So where the, the 911 calls uh, have a whole much broader set of tools at their disposal, that folds right into the regionalization and a, uh, a regional response to dispatch and, and PSAP. Uh, and this report is blind to that. And this, it, this, this ties directly into what I raised at the beginning of the meeting. We should not be entering a new five-year contract with a dysfunctional Capital West that sweeps all its errors under the rug, and then it's marked for discussion, and we, you, you don't even have a discussion when the one person who did have a handle on it is no longer on the council. So I ask you to take action tonight while you still can to reconsider that vote to approve that contract and have a and put it on an agenda for a future meeting. I believe that uh, clerk called to my attention that a motion to reconsider has to be done at the next meeting. Um, so my public comments at this public hearing of the Police Review Commission were not recorded because the city staff was not present and whoever had access to hit the record button in the Zoom button in the Zoom recording could not was not allowed to start the recording so i was unable to re recall and rephrase in a much more compressed time frame uh the detailed comments that i gave early on at the most recent public hearing on the draft the social worker and and street outreach worker those are you're in effect proposing to subcontract those out to nonprofits that are not accountable nor subject to public records law. I believe that any contract that for street outreach to Good Samaritan or another way or even Washington County Mental Health has to be have a condition that they with redactions for confidentiality uh, adhere to public records law. Otherwise, the city is abdicating its responsibility 
for transparency. Um, one other incident where uh, a local person was de detained but not arrested and told he was not being arrested, but if he, he either had to go to Phoenix House or go to jail, but he wasn't going to be arrested. That's coercion. That's what our police department does. And that that just can't be allowed. That stuff goes uninvestigated. I brought issues to the internal affairs officer years ago, and they were never addressed. They were ignored. They were swept under the rug. I saw the, that officer later, and he says, I was about to retire. Why would I make waves? That's an example of what the, the legacy that we're trying to grow out of here. But you don't grow out of it by continuing to sweep it under the rug. Uh, Dispatch is three to four hundred thousand dollars of our budget of the police budget, and in this discussion of how do we reallocate resources, that regional approach to dispatching and PSAP in an accelerated manner, not five years from now, is is the essential is essential to getting this right and starting to reallocate these resources towards uh, human services instead of police response. That should be enough for now. Distrust, the breach of trust will not be healed uh, by whitewashing with this report. Thank you. Anyone else in person wish to comment? Okay. <clears throat> um, so turning to um, the Zoom, uh, Annie Sawyer, I see you have your hand up. Uh, go ahead, Annie. Hello there. Um, I would like to speak to the heart of our community. Um, I don't know how many of you there in this committee actually witnessed um, seeing the outpouring of love and tribute that happened in the aftermath of um, this man's murder, because I, I do think that myself i would say it, that it was a cold-blooded murder and um it, when you look at something like that you could perhaps compare it to say um the case of george floyd you know where you see communities come out and give these beautiful tributes that uh, and and our tributes lasted well past the event um but instead of a person of color you know, you're seeing a person in the mental health community. Now, the mental health community is so incredibly stigmatized. And I'm speaking out as a peer. And I am once again appealing to your hearts. If you saw how much love there was for that man, how could you think otherwise than, you know, that he was a, someone who was, you know, beloved and respected in this community. And just because, you know, he didn't act like others, should he have just been shot dead? You know, there must be better ways in which uh, officers can be, in fact, schooled so that such a thing would just not happen, so that we can have guardians of, you know, of the city, you know, act in such a way that, uh, that will spare human life. Because uh, I, to see it go any other way, I think brings great shame upon huh? this community. Huh? Thank you, Annie. I don't want to cut you off if you have more to say, but that's all I will say right now. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead, Justin. So I was hoping just to briefly respond to the comments regarding the prostitution recommendation. I just want to clarify a couple of things in case it's not clear in the report. The committee is not advocating for the decriminalization of sex work. That is not the recommendation. The recommendation has recommended that the city council remove and repeal the public ordinances 
related to consensual sex work in the city. Uh, the impact that that has in terms of the criminalization of sex work is essentially zero because local communities do not create criminal laws. States create criminal laws. Sex, consensual sex work will remain illegal in the state of Vermont. Human trafficking will remain illegal in the state of Vermont. If you click through to the ordinance that you see that we want to repeal, you'll see that it's quite antiquated and quite sexist. And um, I think many, if not all of the individuals that read it would, uh, would understand that it needs to be repealed. But the committee is not taking the position that all sex work should be decriminalized. There are certainly members on the committee, uh, I think, that would consider themselves um, of the position that consensual sex work should be decriminalized, but that is not at all the committee's position. I would also note that in no way is the committee suggesting that human trafficking should be legalized. And as an attorney and a criminal defense attorney who has defended a number of criminal traffickers in my time, criminal trafficking or human trafficking laws are quite broad and give uh, give prosecutors ample power to prosecute individuals in human trafficking. Really, if you touch sex work in, in any way that involves the use of force or coercion, you can be prosecuted. And we would never, ever um, advocate for those for those laws to be repealed. Um, and in, insofar as the committee recommended support for H-268, as Alyssa said, that is that's already moved. So here we are. Thank you. All right. Um, anyone else online wish to make a comment? Okay. All right. So we're going to um, close. I'm sorry. Um, I think it's important that Abby. Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's okay. I just saw uh, Abby's uh, hand go up. So go ahead, Abby. Um, I just wanted to clarify that um, there were a lot of instances from the two public comments um, in which minors were involved with human trafficking. Um, that is not sex work. In any situation of sex being exchanged for money, um, where there is a minor involved, that's human trafficking, that's sex trafficking, and that's not at all what sex workers want or what this committee wants. Um, so it's really important that we um, just have that distinction between the two. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I just, if you, um, there are a lot of resources linked under the sex work recommendation that prove that when sex work is decriminalized, sexual health of the population increases. And it there are actual benefits to decriminalization of sex work. Um, so it's not, I think there was a comment that said it, it's like the most dangerous profession. Um, that's not true. And there are real tangible benefits to this. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else um, online with us want to make a comment? Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to turn to the council for some thoughts about um, next steps. And I, I, I'm going to start, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, there are with so I, I counted 12 uh, separate recommendations uh, in, that are in this report. Um, I think they all uh, deserve further conversation. And, uh, you know, I was actually re really glad to see that you all the, the, the committee um, did the, the work ahead of time of breaking up like these are the um, recommendations where there's already alignment between the city and the um, police review committee. Um, and so that is that's where I would start may not be where I would end, but I, I think um, my my proposal would be that we uh, take these up um, at future meetings because I mean, I mean this as a as a whole this even just the, the report itself has taken up a lot of time and that's fair because it's a it is a meaty topic and it's worth talking about. Um, 
but each one of these things i think could also themselves have a lot of discussion um as we've already seen um so i would um i would propose that we start to take them up one at a time um and have the the rich discussion about them and uh and then be able to move forward or, or figure out our next steps um uh, for one one topic at a time if that makes sense to you because i, I don't um i think we could also get uh sort of uh sucked into talking about one of these topics um right now and and i think they're they're worth um further conversation perhaps with more time than we have even remaining this evening um so and i and knowing that some of these do have budgetary implications um we do have a budget meeting coming up or we're starting to have budget conversations and so um those are those are timely so i would recommend that we at least put those at the um at the the at least at the head of the conversation because we're going to need to have some decisions about those sooner rather than later um, that is not to ignore the rest of them, but just because of uh, the timing of our process. Um, that's that's where I'm wanting to start. Other thoughts or or whatnot? Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, I generally agree with the approach, and I'm glad to hear that we want to move forward and and look at these. I mean, I do think there's a set of them that we could probably you know, like, sure, let's have the conversation, but like some of the training ones and demilitarization, which is essentially just codifying status quo. And there's some that are asking MPD to basically go back and do some policy work and come back to us. So I think there's probably like a suite that we could move forward relatively quickly. And then, I mean, it makes total sense then to prioritize the ones with budget implications given the timing and kind of work our way through there. But I, I think we might be able to move through. So yeah. I think you're a bunch right. of them um, more yeah. quickly than than you know, than That's that. But probably true. I, I'm eager to take up all of them and hope we can kind of keep on track and keep momentum going. Yeah, great. Other thoughts or comments from the council? Is this? Oh yeah, go ahead, Jay. There's one quick question. It's sort of open ended to the committee. Is um, it seems that with, with some of these recommendations, there might be opportunities to partner with the state or look to the state for consolidated resources. And I wondered if, you know, thinking in, in the weeds a little bit about sort of archiving body camera footage, just as, a, as an example, I wonder if in your conversation um, there was any thought given to how, you know, could we be looking to, to maximize um, or to minimize our budget our budget implication on a local level if we could if we could maximize efficiency on a state level thanks absolutely there are more conversations about that we think it's a great idea there are times to scale to these types of things that's why it's very hard for small towns to have body cameras because of these large overhead costs at this point i would think that if you could somehow um enter into a partnership through with the communities in vermont that it would be significantly cheaper given how cheap storage is these days um, but anyway, yes, that was a conversation that both happened and should happen, and I'm sure the chief can connect you um, in greater detail. And certainly a point for further, yeah, yeah for further conversation. Um, any any other thought? This is sounding like an okay path forward. Maybe there's a suite of things that we can go through quickly, but we also need to talk about budget budgetary items. Okay. Um, then at this point, I think we could probably have uh, a, a motion to accept the report um, and, you know, direct staff to to come up with a sort of a list of future agenda items based on this. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. Is there, yeah, is there a motion to that effect? I would make a motion to accept the report and to move as recommended by the mayor to pull out the items that we need to consider, particularly this year for budgetary okay. considerations. Sure. Is there a second? second. Okay, um, there's a motion and a second. Uh, further conversation. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you again. Um, and please pass along our thanks to the rest of the committee. Yes. Yeah, I, I think uh, 
I think it makes sense. We, we've had a city uh, employee accused multiple times in public comment, and I think it's important to point out uh, that the person mentioned was cleared by two independent investigations with the state police and the attorney general. So I, I think, you know, the council does need to make a statement just to stand by that employee, if indeed we do, and I think we do in this case. The Mark Johnson um, case was an absolute tragedy, and I think we need to learn, and, and hopefully some of the recommendations in this report can steer us to avoiding a situation like that in the future but um i think city council does need to stand by our staff in this case and uh, just wanted to put that on the record thank you any other comments folks want to make okay oh yes jack just uh very briefly as we're coming to to an end um from working on the committee um people on the committee put in a tremendous amount of work. Um, everybody on the committee came to this project with open minds. I think everybody on the committee had their, uh, had their minds changed and did not wind up at the end of the committee of the process exactly where they were at the beginning of the process. I think the, uh, the chief in particular and the uh, Montpelier Police Department and uh, and city staff also were very receptive to the work of the committee and to uh, moving forward. I think in my uh, view of almost a year of working on this project, I would say that one of the headlines should be that uh, we have a lot to be proud of in our uh, Montpelier Police Department. Nobody, including us, is perfect, and there are things that we can do, do better, but um, I think we're on track to doing that. Thank you. Okay, any, anything else folks would like to say before we move on? Okay, oh, Lauren, go ahead. Adding the gratitude, you know, so it was incredible amount of work um, that went into this, like city staff, uh, the chief, the whole team at MPD, and um, all of the volunteers. And also just wanted to thank, I mean, it was referenced in the report that we got 550, you know, pieces of public input. There were so many people that took their time to show up and present to us, to have, you know, offline conversations. So we got an incredible amount of um, public engagement around this and you know just a lot of people's like time and stories and heart like put into you know what we're doing well and what we can do better so I just wanted to express that gratitude as well and my you know ongoing eagerness to keep moving this work forward so thank you to everyone on the committee and everyone in the community and city staff who contributed so much to it thanks um, there was a question about uh, whether the report could be made available in hard copy and I just as a start I am I'm guessing that if someone got in touch with the city and wanted a hard copy that we could provide that for them sure. okay great all right super thank you again uh, yeah yep okay I just want to acknowledge that it is about 9 20 and I am going to turn into a pumpkin at 10 and so there is not, I, I think we may not get through all of the rest of our regularly scheduled things. So, um, yeah. Did you mention that to me that we continue with the homelessness task force? Yep. They've been waiting. Yep. Um, and then the other two items, the budget and the strategic planning was staff driven. And we can see what time we're at okay. and uh, decide which one you want to do. And, one, and the other one will have to be put off. Okay. So whichever you decide. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, all right. Or we can get them both in. <laughs> or maybe we can. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I do see uh, Ken Russell and Rick DeAngelis uh, here with us via Zoom. Um, so um, I'm going to start with, with, with you all, um, turning it over to you. Hi, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Ken Russell, uh, Homelessness Task Force, really uh, pleased to be here. 
Um, and I just want to start off by thanking our task force members who are incredibly dedicated, um, thoughtful folks who show up at pretty much every meeting and ha have done for two years. Um, and done a lot of great work, done a lot of great work in coalition with um, other folks in Washington County working on these issues with city staff. I um, really appreciated the support of council, um, support of folks from the faith community and, and, and collaboration. Um, and, and it's very interesting coming after that previous conversation. And I feel that a lot of what we are proposing is helping to build a system um, for the unhoused um, that goes in the same direction uh, that, that was just being discussed. Um, not non-criminalization of folks, meeting folks where they are, meeting folks um, peer to peer, um, folks with, with lived experience, um, helping each other. Um, so really glad to be here. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Rick, who I'm uncertain of his, of his time frame at this point. So uh, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, hi everybody, good to be here. And I think Ken is exactly right. I thought that discussion, uh, um, the police review committee really helped set the context uh, for our budgetary recommendations. I, I'm gonna add just a little bit more context and I'll do it as briefly and concisely as I, as I can. And um, what I'm gonna try to just argue with a few statements is that homelessness is a really serious challenge right now for the city of Montpelier and the county as a whole, uh, more so uh, than I think at any other time that I can recollect. And I've been in the city for over 30 years. I was your uh, town service officer for I think 10 years at least. So um, the first statement is that, um, you know, the incidence of homelessness right now in Washington County is more than twice what it is in the state as a whole. Now, if we could do that calculation for the city of Montpelier, and there are some challenges with doing that, I would say it's probably three times the rate of what it is as the state as a whole. So uh, secondly, um, right now there is a large unsheltered uh, population in the county. I think I, we're, we're right behind Burlington in that regard. And a great deal of it, probably most of it, is centered in Montpelier. Um, there's, uh, by the numbers, there's three numbers that I want to share with you. One of them is 300, the second is uh, 200, and the third is 50. Uh, the 300 number is that's how many people who are on the, quote, master list or the coordinated entry list for Washington County who are homeless. That's a very big number. It has changed very little over the last year and a half, and I don't see this changing dramatically so. Okay, 200, what is 200? That's the number of people who are living in motels right now who are uh, receiving state assistance, a voucher. And guess what? Um, uh, and this isn't the 50, but there's about 50 of them living in Montpelier in the O'Connell Lodge. Uh, every room in the O'Connell Lodge right now is occupied by somebody that has a emergency voucher. So this is right in our, right in our city. Uh, the other, there's another 50, the third 50, and Don prob will probably give something a little bit higher, but it's around 50 are the number of unsheltered, unhoused people who are on the streets uh, and uh, camping outside in Harbor Park and other places. So, you know, uh, I guess for a big city, this wouldn't be uh, large numbers, but we're a rural community, essentially. These are very, very high numbers. Uh, so with that, that's the preamble, that's the context. I think most of us kind of know that we've got a problem. And uh, with that, we're going to launch right into our budgetary recommendations. I'll kick it back to Ken. Thank you. And over here in the studio, um, I'm going to go ahead and share uh, the, if I think I'm allowed to do that. Am I allowed to share my um, screen? If, if not, we can like... Yes. Okay. Theoretically, yes. Um, here we go. All right. Okay. Is that showing up? Yep. 
Okay, so the first uh, request recommendation is peer outreach expansion through Good Samaritan Haven. Um, and, um, you know, this, this would extend current funding. Um, it would cover half an FTE for a year. Um, and Don, Don is currently working. Um, let me, let me get the right numbers here. Cause, um, she's a 0.5 FTE and the city pays uh, three quarters of that. And Rick is cobbling together other funding for that. Um, you know, the, the, there was conversation previously about pure versus street outreach. Don considers herself both. Um, this certainly goes in the same direction um, as as a previous conversation. And Don, do you want to talk about the importance of peer outreach? Fine. I'm sure. Um, briefly, what I not to repeat what I said earlier. I think. A huge thing with with street outreach is that it reaches underserved populations who are often the most vulnerable, are often chronically expensive in terms of contact with police and emergency services, are often mistrustful or unable to fit into traditional services. They're also geographically, they may not come into the offices. We have to go out to them. Um, and so the, you know, the other thing is, again, a lot of this stuff can be after hours. You can't really schedule emergencies or opportunities. So, um, and at the moment, pretty much the only people out there after hours, as far as I know, are the police and the street outreach people. So I think I've, I've gone over a lot of this before, but um, I think it's really vitally important that we do have people who can reach out outside of office hours and outside of office buildings. And we often do have the trust of more people, but we are really, really stretched right now. And we do, we do definitely need more hours. I'm certainly working over the hours that I'm paid and there, there are other people out there volunteering who are not being paid, who are doing really essential work. Thank you. And, and Zach, did you want to weigh in on peer outreach? Yes, I'll try. My internet was cutting out a little earlier. Um, I'll do it as quick as I can. Just that me and Don have had to work together a few times. Uh, just give you a picture. Uh, we worked with someone for five hours out there. Um, and then we had to uh, drop him off at one of the parks, just to let you know how that is at 10 o'clock at night having to do that because we weren't able to secure uh, resources for this uh, gentleman. So I just want to give you a snapshot of what that's like out there. I know some of you on the task force are new that said you'd like to come out sometime and kind of see what that's like. I'm just giving you a snapshot of what that looks like. And we do provide a com combination of street outreach and peer support. Um, I know earlier that was discussed and street outreach does provide peer support as well. Thank you. Thank you. And in the same vein, we are also asking for um, some indoor space from um, basically five to eight at night, um, Monday through Friday and four to eight at night on Sundays. This would provide some continuity for folks who um, before the before the virus would, would often go to the churches or the congregations uh, during this time of day. Um, another way where I work is open till five um the the warming shelter would open at eight so this would allow a continuity of place for places for people to go um, um oftentimes it's getting on 211 um the, the emergency line to try to get uh accommodations or figure out where folks are going to go for the night um there'll also be access to bathrooms um we've been in conversation uh, um with green mountain transit um they're 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 very open <laughs> idea um, and it had been you know be discussed that um, another way would manage that and I just I'm we I'm wearing two hats there I recused myself from this vote um, we had we had a lot, several instances of that when we went through this package because when it comes down to it this, the folks who are able willing and able to provide some of these services are also the folks serving on this committee 
Um, and so we would, um, so we, we, there would be some combination of street outreach workers, some of another way staff, um, and we're hoping volunteers from the congregations um, to, to um, have a good, strong presence. Um, and the, the, the money we'd be asking for the city for this would, would be that, that first staff member for each shift. But, um, but I think the staffing does need to be, um, you know, we, we want to make sure everybody that that one staff member is well supported in that. Um, there would, you know, and, there, and there's some, you know, questions about how there's like the transit center program, and this is the after hours program. Um, but, you know, there are also, those are all details that can be worked out. Um, moving on to emergency motel rooms, and I, Rick, I believe you were going to speak to this. Yeah, I'll speak to this. Uh, folks, this is just another tool in the toolbox, essentially, uh, to protect life. Um, a, a good solution on a cold winter night when you can't house somebody somewhere else is that you get them into a motel room as soon as possible. And, uh, you know, we've paid for this, our, our agency, quite a few times. And uh, uh, with the unprecedented, unprecedented numbers that we're seeing this year, um, we thought that this could be a helpful solution. Uh, and what's nice about the O'Connell Lodge, if there's a room open there, is that people can walk there. Um, so again, um, nothing magic about this number other than this could be very helpful for us to protect people that have nowhere else to go. And you might say, well, why isn't the state paying for this? Uh, two reasons. Uh, one, some people are not eligible for state assistance. And secondly, if it's too late at night, you can't, you can't line up state assistance. Yeah. And, and I'll just point out, this is a tool that um, we've paid from the another way budget. We've, we've put up people in crisis um, recently mental health chat crisis, uh, d escaping domestic abuse. Um, you know, it's, and it would, you know, and it would be, I will just advocate right here. It would be really great if the governor would keep funding motel rooms, because this is what has kept people out of, out, off the street. And we're, and we're looking at, um, in two, in less than two weeks, we're looking at, um, an infusion of folks onto the streets as winter approaches. Um, and it's going to be dozens of people. And I, I've, well, I've lost track of the exact number. Rick, do you, do you know, or did Don or anybody else know what that, the, what that number is looking like at this point? Uh, people who would be ineligible. Um, well, there's over 200 in the motels now. Um, I can't, um, I think it's a very, very significant number. Uh, I'm gonna guesstimate about, uh, you know, a third at least. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and then, um, our, let's see, we're gonna see emergency, and we'll, we'll, we'll move to public comment after, after we go through this, uh, unless there's a, is it, Morgan, do you have a fact insert here? Or Don? I can wait. Okay, yeah, just, just for clarity on, on the facts at this point, and we'll- I was, have to... I was just getting in line. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, um, moving on to um, emergency transportation support. This is a big need. Um, and it's, it's difficult. Um, there's insurance issues. Um, but we, we need to make a difference. And again, it's that after hours time, sometimes, uh, police departments are, 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 have some downtime and are able to transport people. Um, you know, oftentimes, and sometimes it's individuals out of the goodness of their heart out there getting people from point A to point B. Um, and again, just fast forward to winter time and when folks, it's life and death and, and, and folks needing to get to medical appointments, needing to get to housing, need to even get to, um, a, you know, an office somewhere to, to get their services, needing to get, you know, food for the, for the night. You, you know, you can imagine the gamut, uh, getting to work, trying to get, you know, interview for work. So, so, uh, we it, we um, we're investigating different options about this would look like we we do have 
uh, somebody we we pay to to drive right now. We can expand that. Um, the ideal thing would be to have a taxi service that would show up or my ride to expand what they were they are doing. But it, um, there's other efforts on the countywide level to address this. Um, but it's frustrating, frankly, um, how, how challenging it is. Um, and, and Don, I, you, you're faced with this all the time. Could, do you mind adding on a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, to, to say what would seem obvious, there are three really vital components to getting someone housed. There is access, which has been a huge problem. I think the transit center helps to address that. There is capacity. You need somewhere to put them. But if you can't get them there, it's useless. Um, we do absolutely need more transportation support. There is zero taxi service at night or on the weekends. Um, it's it's just, it's essential. I mean, it's completely pointless. And frequently in the past, people have lost their potential emergency cellular for 30 days or more in the winter because they were not able to physically get to a room that was reserved for them. And that's, that seems so unnecessary and ridiculous. Um, there, there, there are other transportation needs as well. Um, I think you've mentioned a lot of them, Ken. Yeah. But there, there is a serious need here. And without transportation, some of these other things are completely meaningless. So you have to have all three legs of that there. If you can't access it, if you can't get there, if you don't have the capacity, then having one or two of those legs is pretty much meaningless. For it to work, we need all three of those items. And you make reference to them losing a motel voucher for a month. I mean, there's often very punitive rules in place around the use of these public benefits. Um, the other, you know, in terms of access, also the, the thing about the transit center, it would not just be a warming place for people going to the shelter or a bathroom, although these are important, but people need a place to use the phone to call for emergency shelter. They need a place to wait and a phone to get a call back or they don't get the shelter. Um, and, and likewise, if they don't have transportation, then it's useless and they may lose not just shelter for one night, but shelter for 30 days because they didn't get to their room. You know, and we can't address that at the moment, but what we can do is try to make the system more, more effective. You know, what we do have, I don't know if we can increase capacity, but we can at least make what we do have actually usable for people. Yeah. And I, and I think it's important to point out that imagine your, you know, bad customer service experience waiting on hold in a really frustrating way. Imagine doing that when that's the difference between being inside or outside when it's 10 below or, or being able to go for a job interview the next day. Um, there there is, is just one of a bunch of hidden barriers that, that fo the unhoused population faces. Um, winter overflow shelter support. Um, Rick, could you describe this, please? Yeah, sure. Well, as you might imagine, with the need that's out there, we need emergency housing. Um, I, our project at uh, the Twin City Motel, unfortunately, is not going to be ready this winter. We're plan We're going to have two other shelters, one in Barrie and uh, one in Barrie Town, and uh, we have an agreement with the Christchurch uh, to lease the their um, community building uh, to provide up to uh, twelve beds. And um, so my, uh, my budget for that uh, this is uh, November fifteenth through April fifteenth uh, is about seventy thousand dollars. And uh, the state will pay, uh, I'm hoping, uh, the state will pay most of that, about 65. And I've asked for uh, 5,000 here uh, to fill the gap. And one thing that I want to provide with that money is food, because people come in late at night and they often had, haven't had anything to eat. And um, uh, it'd be really nice to provide some meals when they show up. Thank you. And then moving along, um, number six is, and this this is 
um, basically planning study money. Um, you know, there's sort of two, two pieces of this, a, a planning study to, to, to look at the needs. And we changed some of the language from, you know, we, originally it was like a long-term study to a responsive holistic study, recognizing that we're not solving homelessness with this year right now, that there is a huge tragic situation happening on the streets and we have to be responsive. There's been conversations about building shelters, you know, you know pallet homes, different structures, looking at different pieces of property, people trying to push the envelope, you're, you know, you're up against all sorts of things when you're trying to develop something like floodplains, um, you know, legal challenges, ownership issues, siting is, is very, very difficult. Um, and so, but we need to, to push on this. There were, um, there was a great set of, um, designs for day shelters done by students at Vermont, um, tech, um, out of Randolph, um, and a, a well done study could be, uh, could bring down bigger bucks by having a plan and like, okay, this is what's really needed. What are the nuts and bolts? Um, you know, if we, if we're, if we're going to make a real difference here, this is what it's going to take. So it's, it's a, it would be a planning study. And, and then the, the secondary piece of this is in the, something that's been discussed at the countywide level is some studies of the, like the root causes of, of, of what, of why people are out on the streets. Um, and a, and a good, um, story that indicates how that can be important. There was a, there was an indication that I think it was 80% of a population of unhoused individuals had some form of traumatic brain injury. And, um, some of our local folks, um, had contacted the, the researchers on those. And, and it sounds like that does bear, that did bear out. They had a sample size of like 123 in the population they were studying. Um, and so that, you know, that right there would lend to like understanding how folks are out there, what's, what's going on, um, can help you design a better solution. On the other hand, you can also say, we know what's going on. The cost, cost of housing is high. Um, and so, I mean, there's, you know, it, there's, there's some balance there. I mean, and, and, and that, that sort of give and take between what the heck can we do right now? We have an emergency get people, you know, we need to get people off the street and what can we do? Everybody's impatient to, to fix, try to fix this problem. Um, it's incredibly frustrating when the state pulls the rug out um, it, without a real plan. And I, and I guess I should also qualify. I don't know if everybody is, I mean, everybody in their hearts wants to solve this problem, but people don't know what to do. Um, but th this, this will move, move it forward in a, in a, in a, in a good way that provides some specificity and some planning. Um, so that is our, you know, our package. We, 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 we have exceeded the, you know, the money allocated. Um, we, with some understanding, there may be extra money um, in, you know, you know, from on high that, that could be available. Um, we're, you know, we're grateful for the ongoing support of council. Um, um, and we recognize that we're not, it, it's, it's frustrating because we're dealing with a lot of human tragedy and we're working really hard to, to, to do the best we can. Um, and, but this is with a lot of hard work amongst very dedicated people. This is what we've come up with. So, um, and anybody else um, from our task force want to add um, thoughts to this? Yes, this is Zach real quick. Uh, I just want to say that we are attempting to address uh, as many concerns as we can. Um, yeah, we've heard variants of them and, you know, not it isn't a perfect situation, but it's a lot better than uh, what we had. 20 years ago here in the city certainly has opened up a lot of discussion and thank you for the continued support of the community and the council. And, and I, I will just say we're, we're having people from other parts of the state contacting us, asking us what we're doing, what they can learn from us. 
Um, we're meeting, some of us are meeting tomorrow from folks from the from White River Junction. Um, we're getting calls from Rutland. We're getting calls from Lamoille. And, and, and there's folks all over the state, you know, trying to, to respond to this situation. And there's just a lack of affordable, accessible housing. And there are folks working on that. Carolyn, you have your hands up? Yes, I want to do a little bit of clarification on that transportation, which is, as I understand it, it's what happens is somebody shows up late at night, it's cold outside, they spend a couple of hours, they get a voucher for a hotel room. The hotel room is in Burlington. They have to go to Burlington and there's no way to get there. What happens is that they haven't shown up and taken advantage of that, so that's when they get put on the list so that they can have housing for 30 days or some other length of time because they turned down what was available. So this would, would alleviate that situation. You could get them to Burlington or White River or wherever the voucher is, is going to be used. Thank you. Okay. And then I'm going to, I'm going to pull this off the screen and I, and I can put it back up, but I think the next step w would be clarification questions from council on uh, uh, any of these asks. Um, that is, that's fair. Any clarifying questions? I, I feel like I do have some questions, but I'm going to hang on to them for the time being, because I want to hear from the public. Okay. Any other thoughts, questions? Um, yeah, Connor, go ahead. I just want to thank the task force for all their work. We, we asked for some specificity um, in the last few weeks, and this is a very detailed report. Uh, it's a group of people, I think, who know how to sort of duct tape together budgets and make it work, and uh, they know exactly what they need here. Um, I would point out that, spoiler alert, uh, three of our goals, the top priority is addressing homelessness uh, out of the six there, so I think this is in line with the direction we're going. Um, and it's, it's a very real and immediate need. I mean, it's pretty unconscionable uh, that the Scott administration would consider in a couple of weeks letting so many people out on the street just as the weather's getting cold here. Um, so this is very much a Band-Aid, I think, approach to fixing some of that, uh, but it's, it's very necessary. And the consultant dollars, I, I think a lot of the time, we feel like we're shooting in the dark here, um, just to have some data, have some clarity on how to move forward as we look at a bigger maybe infrastructure project uh, is desperately needed for the conversation. So we have all the information we need to make an intelligent decision. Uh, but again, I wanna thank Cameron for the, doing the staff work on this and, and the entire committee for a, a really, really good uh, set of proposals here. Oh, Jack, go ahead. Um, thanks for the report, I think it was great. Um, one of the questions I have, and I, I'm right on top of the microphone. Um, it's not you, it's your equipment, yeah. Yeah, how's this? I'm trying now. Can people hear me? No, it's not, it's not in the BA. Okay, um, keep, oh, there, we go. there I am. Okay. Thank you for the report. I think it was very good. Um, and as Connor said, provides exactly what we're, we've been asking for. One of the uh, questions that I have and it's not the precisely the same hours of the day, but there is the proposal for funding for uh, for staffing at the transit center, and we um, we've heard a number of uh, times at our meetings that uh, the that Green Mountain Transit is required contractually obligated to provide uh, staffing for the transit center that they're not doing, and I wonder. Uh, if uh, if Bill or anyone can can give us the answer to what what's going on there, raise the question. Um, I'm not sure what, how you'd want. Is 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 there a contract that uh, requires? So the, the, there is a lease with the with GMTA that requires uh, bathrooms to be open pending their budget their budget availability resources. So I so to answer the question, we have a lease with GMT that 
that calls for the bathrooms to be open and them to staff it pending their budget resources and their current resource, which comes primarily from the state, does not include enough funding for resources now. Um, so that's that's the situation. Um, I think their their desire to have it open full time uh, as much as we do, and that's I think they're what's causing this request here. Oh, well, thank thank you. That's a, that's a great explanation. Whether we like the outcome or not is another question, but, but thank you for that clarification. Any other clarifying? Yes, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm curious, I'll project just in case you can't hear me. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious where the uh, cost estimate for the, or, or how the numbers put together for the emergency hotel rooms, um, where the, the 80 plus nights, are, are, is this meant to be sort of a, a backstop, an emergency situation? Um, for usage, or is that a number a number based on a certain number of nights relative to folks who are in there now? Is this just something for a, kind of a worst case scenario where it's late at night and there's bad weather to help get through um, through the next few months in the winter? Thanks. Uh, it's I did it. It was a back of the envelope calculation, and it's what you said right at the end there. I called up the owners of the O'Connell Lodge and Hilltop. They offered me a negotiated rate, and uh, and then I just picked the number of nights, and that's how we got it. <laughs> and it's. In I think this. Go on. <laughs> Anything. I was just going to say that I think this is particularly necessary in light of the fact that in a normal year, pre-COVID, we would have had forty-five. Um, am I right on that? Maximum, we would have had 35, I'm sorry, 35 overflow shelter beds available per night, most of which would have been full. In light of the fact that at the moment we are looking at 10 to 12 shelter beds, plus I hope this motel room that Rick is talking about, we will have the same or greater number of people as we did pre-COVID, but we have only 10 overflow rooms. So. You know, and we have more people also competing for the, I believe, competing for the motel room. So I would say that this this particular item is is more necessary than it's ever been. Yeah, go ahead. Just on that, uh, we've asked the Barry City Council to match that number. Councilor Wazizak is uh, going to bring that to their attention in a future meeting. I just want to note, Don. I know you had had your hand up a little earlier. If you uh, if you had something else you wanted to add, now would be an okay time. Okay. Um, yeah. Just again, what I what I said is that we do, as I just said, we have less capacity than we've ever than we've had in the past three or four years, and we have more need than we've had. So I think this is it's not adequate but it's an, a really necessary step and even in a normal year when we did have that 35 bed capacity we often had people who did not we often needed an emergency room at that time so with greater need and less capacity we will certainly need to use that okay. thank you can I just clarify yeah. with my question? Well, certainly not to uh, to question the, the validity of the request, but I was more concerned that it was um, too small of a request based on on what the anticipated need was. So, um, that I just if we to... if we could get more, that would be great. <laughs> Good job, Don. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Stephen, you have a comment you want to make, and then we're going to go to Morgan. Okay. Yeah. The. Uh... As you recall, I advocated strongly for a long time to get you to form this task force and ask that you dot pack it with service providers who are going to drag anchor, protect the status quo. Unfortunately, four of the current members are working for another way or good Sam right now. And in effect, having to recuse themselves, leaving less than a quorum voting to approve this budget. There, there is no plan here. This emperor has no clothes. Uh, I point to the printed today from the city's website. Uh, the homelessness task force is charged with to provide the city with a report in three months that includes 
concrete ideas for longer term structural systems budget timeline. That was a year and a half ago. So they have indeed dragged anchor for two years. So you, you didn't get your report and nobody thought to ask for where's the report in three in three months. So the scope of the report was to include the scope of homelessness, the needs of people experiencing, the perceived barriers, the systems currently in place, potential solutions, and existing strategies in other cities. Now they're saying, we've had two years, we didn't do our job, now we want to pay somebody 20000 25000 And by the way, we're not going to spend that 25000 putting a roof over anybody's uh, body this winter. It's absolutely absurd. It's unconscionable to spend all this money on peer outreach. What good is peer outreach if there's no services to point them to? You know, that it, it, it's outrageous that I also w w take issue with uh, the city manager's characterization. It's not pending budget. The lease reads that it's pending staff and the staff there has expressed willingness to work more hours. They just, by working more hours, they will trigger benefits. So. They, they got $9 million, Green Mountain Transit got $9 million in federal funding uh, for COVID funding. So there's no excuse to not honor the terms of the lease. And there's no excuse to misrepresent what the lease says to the city council. So we set at the first meetings of the homelessness task force, toilets, showers, phone charging, lockers, designated camping areas, and digital privacy of the what I call the, the uh, homelessness management information system. They refer to it as the con continuum of care. I call it the continuum of don't care. The, this plan or lack thereof includes no provision for those who are banned or mistrustful or otherwise uh, unwelcome at some of whom I talked to this evening who are unwelcome at another way or good Sam for various reasons. And it's like, oh, they're disposable. Good Sam, our, our partners who aren't subject to public records law can arbitrarily tell somebody don't come around and they're left outside and there's no appeal route. And this council's not gonna be an appeal route or maybe you strike, put that in your contract. You hear appeals from people who are told they can't go to these places since we're paying for it with public city, public taxpayer dollars. Folks that have left, some people have left those organizations for, because their property was being stolen, because they were being sexually exploited or hit on, so in one case by a, a registered sex offender who wasn't required to register. The, the Christchurch proposal for 12 beds during a pandemic is a disaster waiting to happen without adequate ventilation and separation to put people in a congregate shelter was deemed unconscionable last year and it's unconscionable this year. Uh, the Econo Lodge, uh, Rick just said that it's full. So you might allocate $7,000 or more as Jay inquired into and find that we, we can't put them in, in the rooms. That rate and that budget, that budget allocation is only for a $70 rate for 100 nights at Econo Lodge. That doesn't allow you to send somebody up to uh, Comfort Inn or uh, Capitol Plaza for in worst case. Uh, so there's no protocol here. There's no protocol for do you need to exhaust your appeal with 211 first? Do you, who's making the ultimate decision whether you get a, a local voucher or not? There's no plan here. This is made up stuff over the last few weeks. And then they shut down public comment in, in the last hearing of the task force where we were try I was trying to comment on troubleshoot some of these budget areas. The state rules, one of your first priorities would be to remove the state rule, that punitive state rule that bans somebody for 30 days from getting a voucher just because they missed a night in a hotel. That, that's absurd and that can be changed very quickly in the legislature. Uh, they, he did raise the insurance issues with transport. Uh, that thing could blow up dramatically if somebody gets hurt in a, in a car with it's not properly insured. Fundamentally, this entire program lacks the dignity. I, I always asserted that dignity had to be the foundation of these. And to ask people to move every night, to constantly worry about where their belongings, we proposed soft shelters, either Conestoga huts or 
uh, pallet shelters located on available land with plumbing and shower trailers and, and toilet trailers. And they didn't want to do the work even to put that in place for this winter. So to keep people disrupted and moving every night, throw them out of the shelter at eight o'clock in the morning, not let them back in until 8.30 at night in the hotel, transport them. It's, it's, a, it's a horrid existence you're wishing upon these people, all for lack of your task force having done their job over the last two years. So the, these folks need support. They need continuity of a safe place to sleep, a safe place to keep their belongings. They need hygiene access. There's plenty of jobs out there right now, but they're not even believing they're capable of applying for one because they don't have that continuity of where their personal possessions and where their sleep is going to happen. So this is a, a gross abuse of public dollars to approach it in this way and say, kick it down the road for another year to start putting a plan together. Why would we pay the transit center water and sewer when we give them that building for a dollar a year? It's, a, it's, our, it's the city's building. We give it to them for a dollar a year and we're proposing to pay them for water and sewer charges? I mean, that's just absurd. Uh, they've been months and months in violation of the keeping the bathrooms open from 11 to 2.30. As a penalty for that, they should just write off the water and sewer and even the cleaning. Uh, they, they are a business. They, are, uh, they have a, a much bigger budget than our homelessness task force. Uh, why are we treating the Green Mountain Transit with kid gloves when we're leaving people out on the street without access and then they're crapping on the the bike path during our, so I also proposed a local answering service so that these callbacks and, and they could patch together 211. 211 does insist on speaking to the person who's gonna be availing of the service, but our answering service could make those calls and sit in those hold queue and just patch them together when it's, when it's they, they actually get through. All of these things were just tossed aside by your esteemed homelessness task force. Ineffective, Homeless, homelessness taskless force, I would call it. That's enough. Oh, one other thing, I would ask a question and ask you to get an answer. I found this, a message from Montpelier's homelessness task force that says it was a paid advertorial that appeared in the April 28th issue of the bridge. Whose money spent? Whose whose money was spent on that? You know, a puff piece of all the work they haven't done for two years. Thank you, Stephen. Um, now, to be fair, I know you're a um, critic of the group, though I uh, remain very grateful for this group and the work that they've done. And just like the homelessness task force, sometimes folks, oh, not the homeless, the the police review committee took a little extra time. It is, I'm, I'm grateful to have this report here in front of us now. Um, and I think there's some really great suggestions here and I think it does um, line up with uh, some of the goals that were set out at the outset. So um, having said that, um, I, uh, I do have a couple other questions um, for this, for the group, but, um, oh, I'm sorry, Morgan. Yes, please go ahead, Morgan. Uh, yeah, Morgan looks frozen right now. Uh, did you have something you wanted to? Oh, yeah, please. Yeah. While, while we're waiting for more, I mean, Morgan may. Right. Oh, oh, okay. Go ahead, Morgan. Morgan we can hear you w. now. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Morgan W. Brown, Montpelier Resident District 3. Can you, uh, can you hear me all right? Hold on. Hold on. I can hear you. Okay. So, um, first, I want to address something before I go into what I was going to say. Stephen Whitaker uh, just asked, who was it that paid for the ad in the Mapiga Bridge for the Homelessness Task Force to give a message? <clears throat> and I want to go on record to say the anonymous person was myself. I used nearly half of the COVID-19 stimulus check to do it. And I don't regret it. 
And if I could do it again, I'd do it. I didn't want to come forward, but since he's challenged it, there it is. Okay, there's your answer. So, uh, for the benefit of the new city council member of my district three, Jennifer Morton, who might not know me, I wanna, I wanna say that I'm a person who uh, had lived homeless off and on for quite a bit of my life since I was 17, fleeing abuse, severe abuse, and. Although I, you know, wasn't always necessarily homeless. I sometimes was housed. A lot of times, it was, uh, you know, couch serving and and such. Uh, I wasn't permanently housed. You know, the last go around was in the Mafia area mostly, and that was 12 years until I got housed. You know where I am now, and I have been housed for just over 12 years now, thanks to a lot of different people that helped. It made a difference. So what I want to say is, oh, and by the way, I'm a former member of the task force. What I want to say is I fully support the additional ask for the $35,883 above the uh, $45,000. And I ask that the city council please support this. It will help. You know, sometimes a Band-Aid might not be enough, but it's better than nothing. And I know. And please, you know, and, and Jay, thank you. You know, hey, if you want to find and allocate more, hey, you got my support. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Morgan. Um, anyone else either? Oh, yes, right. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, it's Bob Gowans. It's for Rick. Rick, on uh, concerning the Christ Church, if you could, um, or somebody in the staff, get hold of either myself or Chris Lumber, probably sooner than later, so we can get in there and uh, develop a life safety plan for that. A couple years ago, when um, when we looked at there were two or three things, not big deals, but need to be corrected before we can let people sleep in there. So if you could just reach out to either myself or Chris, we'll work with you on that. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Yeah, sorry, I didn't think to, to check in with you beforehand. Uh, it's been moving pretty fast, but I will be in touch. <laughs> Thank you. Gotta love a small town. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Is my look at planning money I always think of there's maybe places to get grants and, you know, uh, Kevin uh, Casey in planning, who does a lot of community development grants. That's the only amount that I really look at twice is when you're looking at a short term emergency fix that this is, then I would look elsewhere for planning money. Uh, and I just wondered if you've been able to check into any of those places that might give you money for planning. When they won't give you money for operations. I I know that we did ask Kevin. Um, I don't know if Cameron's in the room. Um, she was going to touch base with him on planning. Um, it's not. I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking, uh, but I, I hear what you're saying, and and I would assume that there, you know, there there is other money out there, and I appreciate always looking for that. Well, and I believe it's is it Charles Brown, who's uh, families, the Department of Families and I, or his children. John I, Brown? Yeah, Char, okay. He spoke at Rotary a, a few weeks ago, and he, he certainly gave the impression that there was funds there, not only for services, but perhaps for some planning money. Uh, I unfortunately don't know the services. I would just rather see us try to go after a grant for planning money if that's possible. I, can I just say, I mean, for, at least from my vantage point is folks are maxed out working 24 seven on this issue, um, responding to crises on the street. So this was, I, I think, a way to say, 
okay, we need to keep our eye on the bigger systemic solution. Absolutely, yes. Didn't, so could, um, oh. Did we also word that so that part of the mission of the, the people who are working on the survey would be to develop plans, practical, specific plans that would help us to overcome the barriers and put out proposals that might produce results that we need? I mean, I know that I know I remember having emphasized that, and I thought that we had also put that in there as one of the goals of the consultants or whoever does this uh, was not just to determine the causes, but to come up with information on how to get through the barriers and put together an actionable plan, which, as Ken said, we are incredibly maxed out. Um, Okay. So it's it's very difficult to, to get through all that. Needed, wasn't saying otherwise. Totally, you need you need to have consultant assistance to get what you need to know. Absolutely. So I can build on that. Yeah, from staff perspective is we have talked about finding grants for that, um, finding planning grants. There's not a lot available for the planning side, especially for infrastructure, especially for housing. There's a lot of money for creating the housing and housing partnerships. And part of their homelessness task force's conversation and ask was to get funding so that they could be ready to apply for those larger grants that could get us an infrastructure sort of project going. Um, you know, recognizing that um, all of these folks are volunteers, community members um, who may not have the expertise to create such a plan. So um, that also does not dissuade us from applying for grants if we find them so if there is any funding opportunities that folks are aware of, uh, we will welcome those. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, did you have something to add to that? I saw you, you had a hand up and. I think she basically covered it, that what we were looking for was substantiation, something to back up a grant application so that it would carry more weight. Um, okay, thank you. I mean, if there's anyone out there who wants to come up with a specific plan, a specific proposal, a grant proposal that would address some of these problems more effectively sooner on a larger scale, we would absolutely, I think I speak for everyone, we would absolutely welcome anyone who has the time, the expertise, whatever. Thank you. Uh, Rick, Rick, you have your hand up. Uh, yeah, I just... Um, I have a very specific request if the council does take action on these items. Uh, the item about the uh, street outreach is called peer outreach. Um, I, since I'm the guy that's got to hire the person, um, I, I would request that that just be called street outreach. Um, it, it, uh, I understand the value of peer outreach and having a peer worker. We have one right now and that's fantastic. But um, it's going to make it difficult for us to, to fill the second position. We already actually have a candidate working in that capacity. So. so my question was um, was really about the same one that Donna had a question about, the number six, uh, consulted study uh, a day shelter. Um, the, I, I just... Uh, I guess my question, I don't know how to frame this in a way that's e easier somehow, but um, I mean, as far, like when I read day shelter, I think another way, right? And so um, I, I, I do wanna say like, this is like one one part of something Stephen brought up that I did have some concerns about, which is that it it does feel a little conflict of interesty um, because you know, if we study this and then maybe we're creating some competition for another way, or maybe it's something that another way expands into. And so I, I don't necessarily understand the relationship between um, uh, what's being proposed and, and um, another way's services. And if I'm off base on this, like that is fine. I just need to yeah, no, I, I appreciate that question. I mean, I mean, from my perspective, it's acknowledged it was with the homelessness task force hat looking at the need in the community 
there there is a give, there is a balancing act in terms of mission at another way we there there's some back and forth in our conversations internally about psychiatric survivors versus homeless population um and there's some work we're and i mean we um we're not a shelter we, we have a program and so we and we're not a low barrier shelter i mean right now we have required to be vaccinated and masked to access so there are folks who are outside right now who, who, who could come to another way who are not um, because they won't abide by our rules. So that, that's a piece of it. Um, I, as far as the, you know, I, in terms of the conceptualization of this piece, I, I frankly had no concept that another way would be part of that. It was like, what's the need in the community? Um, and, but, but there is this, you know, folks in who or my constituents at another way are like, the city's always looking to another way to solve the social service problems in, in the town. And we have a different, we have a different mission. And so I, as executive director there, I'm trying to always find that balance. Mm, okay, thank you. That's that's actually quite helpful. Um, separate question, and this is um, kind of a meta question, but it's that we're going to need to talk about. I think as a group, um, this proposal is uh, you know reading through the cover letter. Um, on the one hand, it looks like it's maybe a request that's coming from that $50,000 that we set aside from uh, ARPA money. Um, that's one potential pot of money that could go towards this. Um, it, there were a couple places where it sounded like it was maybe coming from the budget, which would make it a, a budget request. Because I think of ARPA money as, as separate. That's, that's a different pot than the budget conversation that we are about to start. Um, if it is a part of the 50,000 that we set aside for ARPA, there is a question that, um, the, like that money is going to come to us over a couple of years. And so one question is, is this, does this 50,000, um, come out of sort of this year's allocation or next year's allocation, or is it split 50, 50 or some other way? Um, and I know that we are going to be having further conversation about this very topic um, next meeting. I think it's next meeting. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yes, no, it is scheduled for next meeting. Okay. Um, so I want to recognize that with the ARPA money, at least um, Lauren we had had mentioned, you know, maybe we could have some kind of public process about getting suggestions for what to do with that 50,000 and uh, on the one hand like here's a proposal this is this is good but we haven't really talked about the process for how we were going to allocate that 50,000 and if we wanted to have any more robust process around that so I realize that is sort of a meta question um, otherwise I'll just speak for myself and say you know thank you for this report I want to I want to support this and I you know whether that's it's easier to do it through the ARPA money but I don't want to jump to that if there hasn't been a process around the fifty thousand dollars um and I see some hands starting to go up so um Lauren and then Jennifer maybe yeah okay I mean in terms of what I was thinking when I proposed that we pull 50,000 out and I was thinking of it as that first kind of set of money that came in um, and I was really thinking about it and I think the conversation we had was about emergency needs I was specifically thinking about the homelessness task force and I think we talked about that as a likely venue for it I know I've talked about public process I was thinking more of the 700,000 that's not yet allocated I mean to me this is basically what we asked for was what could we do that's really addressing urgent needs of community members and instead of just putting the full amount into infrastructure that we set 
some piece aside. So to me, it's very responsive to that and re right in line with our conversation. I mean, I guess I'm like, I don't want to hold up getting things going. Um, I mean, it could be that a big chunk of this is the 25,000 for the longer term planning. We could move forward the other pots of money if we wanted to that um, and have, a, you know, that's that's a big chunk of what is being asked for. We could have a longer process if we think there's more. I, I'm not advocating for extra process. To me, I, I would be happy to support this proposal today. Um, and I've got some other thoughts on the proposal in general, but just in terms of your process question, I think that's where I'm at. No, that's that's helpful. Um, Jennifer, thoughts? Yeah, um, just, just to put it out there, I've, I've worked with the homeless populations both on the West Coast and here in Vermont for 20 years. And just looking at this proposal feels very gentle compared to how much work needs to be done and i feel like this isn't a huge i mean and i'm talking you know i worked in very big cities so i and i currently work with homeless populations here in vermont but um i feel like this is a really nice proposal and i would like to you know just put that out there as okay. somebody who's worked with these communities for a long time yeah Great, thank you. Um, any other thoughts around the process for that 50,000? Yeah, I go ahead. Agree with Lauren. I think this was my recollection of the conversation when we set aside the 50,000. Uh, the homelessness task force was specifically brought up and uh, we did make them aware that this money could be available for things like this. It, it is a pretty pressing emergency, so I, I think it's reasonable. Um, Donna, I can see you want to say something. <laughs> Remember, I kept, I kept plugging for housing. Oh, yes. And right. so, uh, and not so much just staffing at, at this level. Um, but if you could take the 25000 out for now, as far as right now taking the forty five that we've already allocated, and then add from the fifty to balance it, but not yet the twenty five without a little more talking, um, I would feel more comfortable. But. I'm a little confused. The forty-five. What's I believe in this year budget. Oh, I'm sorry. We that's that's we where have the first forty-five thousand in this year budget. Got you. So they were only asking for thirty-five thousand and eight hundred right. and some out of the new, the possible rescue money. I think what Don is saying yes. is take ten thousand eighty-three from. The fifty thousand of ARPA we've set aside, along with the forty-five, give the for, for tonight, and then continue the conversation about the twenty-five thousand along with ARPA. Okay. Yeah, that's and, what I meant. Okay. Okay. You, Go ahead, Connor. Are you, are you you saying you would use other funds besides the ARPA money for that, or you would just? I don't know. I don't know. Further discussion on it. Yes. Uh, because I'm I still am concerned about plugging some of that money of the. And you guys abbreviate it and you say ARFA, but I never get it right. So American <laughs> Rescue Money um, to more clearly going after the core issue of housing. I mean, I would much rather work towards having a facility in place and put the staff around that. But yeah, other uh, any other thoughts on on that possibility? Go ahead, Connor. I might just ask uh, Ken or Rick or somebody from the committee. Uh, 10,000 of that I know was set aside. I thought that was a bigger piece of the pie for the continuum of care. Uh, that might be just going into a bigger pot. So I don't know if there might be a bit more urgency on the 10,000 within that, 25. What 10,000? Yeah. All right. Uh, 10,000 for what, Connor? Do you see the research in the Washington County continuum of care is right. the 10,000 within the 25,000? And if that was time sensitive with yeah, the uh, bigger group there? No, I, I, I don't think it is. I mean, I mean, part of it on the, the first, the research, we put the language in there for responsive. So the thinking was if somebody can come up with a quick solution, not a long-term solution, you know, that that allows some latitude for time for for being responsive to the to the situation. So, 
most urgent piece of, of that 25. Well, I think that 15,000 um, was to provide the basis, do the research to support going after grant money. That was my understanding when we, we were talking with Cameron in our meeting. And so it's not immediate, but it is immediate in the sense that uh, one would want to go after bigger funds at a, at a different in a different location, you know, from the state or whatever pots are available. So we would want to be prepared to support that request. This is maybe too much in the weeds, but uh, so I, I, you know, just as an example, I would support the the peer outreach expansion. Uh, that's the that's twenty three thousand uh, six eighty. In my mind, that is not a one time cost, and so I would prefer that kind of thing to come out of the budget rather than the ARPA money, which is one time. Um, but the, but this is yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Bill. Well, I again, I'd like to. I'm not here to defend or, or yep. argue for or against. But forty five thousand of the eighty thousand is coming from our budget. Right. So oh, I see. So, so that could be a part. Okay, thank so you. So there's only thirty five thousand that's on, on top, top of that that they're asking for from ARPA right now. Okay. Um, and you recall, uh, so so if I can just allow me a second. When Go we for it. when we allowed the fifty thousand, when we set this fifty thousand aside, at that point we only were aware that we were getting three hundred and eighty thousand dollars this year. That was the only number. So we said we were going to allocate three hundred and thirty thousand to capital and equipment, which we did, and keep fifty thousand aside for to be determined. But I think you know, so yes, housing was mentioned as well as homelessness services. So that we never voted on what that last fifty thousand. Is going to be. I think it was. We've since learned that we're going to get 1.1 million this year, and 1.1 million next year. So we, and we have the 1.1 million in hand now, and it's been sent to us. So, what you have said collectively is that 1.5 million out of the 2.2 will be will go to replacing projects that we cut out of the budget. So that still leaves, I think this is where Lawrence sort of with a 700,000 or maybe 650 if we take the 50,000 out to be determined what that needs to be used for over. And then the, just the question is, do we hold that 650 this year, next year? Do we split that up? How does that go? And I think that's a conversation we need to have. But you have a lot more ARPA money that is not yet called for that could do many of the projects or, or initiatives that you're talking about, or it could just go back to do even more capital. I mean, you've got a lot of choices. So I, just, I wanna make sure that we're putting that in context that the, you know, this 50,000 isn't the last bit mm -hmm. of rescue money you have, and that 45,000 of this request is from the budget, is from our Thank approved you. budget. Yeah, that's a good call. Fair enough. So what is your desire to do, team? <laughs> Yes, go ahead, Jack. As I think about this, am I being heard? Okay. As I think about this, I think I share Donna's thought that we may need to give some more thought to the planning component, the item six of this. And, uh, and I also think, you know, want, wanting to support what uh, what the task force is uh, is asking for the other thought i have is that uh, we may, we may very well find that the the amounts they're asking for in items particularly items one three four and five are not enough, and uh, those seem like those would be valid uh, ARPA uh, funding requests if if we if we need to go that way. So I think 
my inclination is to uh, take out the uh, item six from their uh, their request for now to uh, hold that for uh, further thought and uh, and also keep in mind that and, and approve the remainder but also keep in mind that uh, I would be open to further funding requests out of the fiscal 2022 ARPA or the first tranche of the ARPA money um, if if uh, there are needs that can't be met from any other source for emergency shelter. And I don't know if Ken or Rick have any thoughts about how consistent that is with your uh, assessment of me or Zach, sorry. Well, I, 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 I like what you just said because uh, you're being very supportive in your comments and you're leaving the door open. I, this is it, you know, it's, um, as you're trying to plan solutions, um, yeah, everybody wants to think big, but we're trying to make things happen and respond. I thought that Morgan's comments were right on target. Nobody wants to do a Band-Aid, but um, um, it's something, and it's responding to the, the human suffering immediately. So I, 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 don't, I can't speak for the whole committee, but I like what you said. And I, frankly, I'm... I'm in accord with you on number six. I think it needs more discussion and planning myself. Okay. Um, so here's here's a possibility, team. Um, uh, it's getting late, and we're going to be talking about this, uh, like the, how we apportion this fifty thousand dollars next time. Um, I think. I, you know, I, I hate to, to do this to, to, to the homelessness task force, but I think it might make some sense to take this up um, next time in conjunction with that conversation so that we can um, make a decision all at the same time, unless you want to vote on it now, which would be okay too. Um, I do. Okay, that's great. In fact, I think we just need to like do, we need to do something. <laughs> I love listening to everybody, you know, because I always have these shifts. It's wonderful. I really think that I, I'm going to make a motion. We'll see okay. Where it goes. Okay. So my motion is that we award this request as asked for. We apply the forty-five thousand that's in this year's budget, and the remaining thirty-five whatever from the ARFA money. But we leave twenty the twenty-five thousand a little more open to be refined. But we still dedicate that much money towards some sort of planning. And I do know, I mean, just recently with the Public Safety Authority, having a consultant come in, you think you all know everything, but it just pulls things together, that expertise, that focus, that time. So I want us to do it now. Okay. One, I'm not going to be great. here next meeting, too. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> I'm going to be in okay. Sweden, and I have a different yeah. time Ooh. zone. Ooh. But uh, I, so, yeah, that's my motion. Okay. I'll second that. Uh, okay. And I'll, I'll just emphasize the point. I, I think we, we can sit on the consultant a bit, but as Don is saying, you know, the homelessness task force can't do a ton unless we have an idea yeah. of where you could build something, who could run it, how much it's going to cost, and what the population is. And I think we still have a lot of question marks in those meetings. Yeah. So this would go towards that purpose. So thanks, Don. Okay. Um, uh, Lauren, go ahead. One clarifying question, um, and then a couple of thoughts. Just on the restroom piece, like I know at various points we've talked about, you know, getting a trailer with showers. Like, is that just it's just not available, or why is that not an option anymore? And so we're paying instead for a few hours of GMT per day. Yeah, we were working with the Baptist Church on the trailer, but as more information came out, it, it turned out. Couple of things. The uh, laundry didn't would would only be towels, right? So that was a bit limiting. 
the second and biggest is it won't withstand the cold. Um, okay. So um, once it went below freezing, it would be gone anyways, and that would only give us a month. So we're seeing this as a better year-round access Yeah. So issue. Get going, okay. going transit Thank you. Better, yeah. That's really helpful. Um, yeah. I mean, I I, I am going to support this motion. I think we need to get things moving, show the clear support for this. I mean, I'm frankly sickened that the state is not doing this. I don't think this should be falling on communities. I think this is absurd and egregious and, um, you know, but here we are and we have to help people in our community. And so this, these are some steps we can take as we look at longer term solutions. You know, I'm glad to see the consultant doing, you know, it looks like if we can refine that further, that could be really good work um, to, to move this forward and looking at root causes. Um, you know, I, I think we could also simultaneously just hearing some of the barriers that these are addressing. It sounds like, you know, are is there an opportunity to maybe advocate for some state community grants where we don't have these strings that seem to be really making it hard for people to access services? Um, are there policy changes we should be advocating for, as came up a couple times tonight, um, that, you know, it sounds like there's some really well-known problematic criteria, like you don't show up and then you're, you know, out of luck for 30 days. Like, so I think trying to also catalog those as either, you know, part of the task force or part of the, the study. But I mean, some of that, it would be great to also be trying to address some of those issues too, so that more state resources are actually available to more people. Thanks. All right. Uh, okay, there's been a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Got it. Okay. All right. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. Um, great. So thank you uh, again. Yeah. And, and thank you. And I just sincerely appreciate um, all y'all and, and, and the collective wisdom trying to crack some really tough problems and, you know, any, uh, the, the the thought the feedback adds adds wisdom to to this and it, it's really is true it's like it's like freaking frustrating <laughs> trying you know and you know and so i appreciated like that time when when y'all had sean brown come in and sarah phillips sort of set the stage and sometimes you don't think big enough you know and so i, I appreciate the, you know this the, we're doing the best we can and sometimes it's like we're don't see what's in front of us so thank you thank you all right so i just want to check in it is getting late here team we could we have two, at least two other items um, yeah i've already communicated with the finance director we'll put off the budget okay item. um the only question i think was whether you wanted to go ahead with the community survey and this council survey do we'll get to work on those that was part of her presentation okay so about the budget the, the budget present we we're going to do the overview of the budget and kind of how the process was going to go and all that stuff but that can wait till the next meeting okay as long as we don't stack that one up yep and then we have the strat plan uh cameron does have a presentation but it's really up to you whether you want to do that um i i know i will receive it better if we do it another time i'm really sorry okay. um we can send out the slides and things that we were going to do. Yeah, I think that the, the key part of that was your straw poll votes on ranking the the uh, priority, you know, the initiatives, and we were. I think what we were really looking was for you to officially adopt those, those. and so, we should. So that and because and then our, but, the idea was if you did that tonight, then we were going to present have the the full strategic plan for your approval at the next meeting. So we that was the only. But we'll we'll see what we can figure out. Okay. All right. Um, and we did not take up uh, the appointments to the vacancies left by Councillor Richardson. That is well. No, I, there's no there's nothing urgent about it I, as I understand it at the moment. Is that pretty I, accurate? I think. I mean, the biggest issue probably is CVPSA. But did we did we replace him on CVPSA? No. No. no okay. I was going to bring that's the only one that I know that's up. Okay. Because right now Montpelier is the only one on the Public Safety Authority Board that doesn't have both 
positions filled. Okay, well, maybe we can talk about that during council reports too, because we have to talk about CBPSA anyway. Um, we can check in with folks. And if it's not apparent what we want to do, then we can. I mean, even if you just, you can advertise, it doesn't have to be a council member. Oh, it doesn't it's have to nice be a council member. Oh. It is. We have Doug Hoyt right now as the one representative from Montpelier. Okay. Uh, okay, then. Um, so we're, so we're pushing off those couple of items, or three items, really, mm -hmm. uh, generally. Um, thank you. So we're on to council reports, and I'm going to start with Donna. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. brought up that I emailed you all the dates for the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority, along with our consultant, is it presenting to the joint councils on the 19th. Uh, Barry City had that change from the 20th, and they are doing it in their chamber. So they are doing the Zoom link. They're the host. Bill has informed us that we all need to post an agenda, but when you post that agenda, it should have Barry City link in it. Uh, and my question to Anne was, were city council members planning to go to Barry in person or were people planning to come here? I reserved this room in case you wanted to do that. I'm not sure you need to. I mean, I think you could, we're, we're looking into that, whether we actually have to have a physical, I think you can also just go remote. So you could either go to Barry, we could choose to meet here, or you can just remote in. I think the consultants are doing it by remote. No, they are. Yes, so. well, they are, but I, I was going, because I'm also presenting and, right. and sort of facilitating it, so I'm going to be there. Correct. Uh, but we will have somebody here for Public Safety Authority, because especially people who belong to Capital Farm Mutual Aid, a lot of them have weak Wi-Fi at home, mm -hmm. and so they want a place to come that they can get so stronger Wi-Fi. So uh, we, we have this space. Okay. So there'll be somebody here uh, from Public Safety Authority so right we now. We should be sure to make sure we have our tech ready. Yeah, and well, and well, we haven't used that, but um, Cameron's going to show me after the meeting tonight how to connect it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just yeah. Didn't, that's news, so that's good to know. Okay, and it is this whole zooming who right. links etc. is confusing, but I just thought perhaps the council wanted to discuss whether they had a preference to be as a group in live. It is somewhat dynamic to meet another council, and their council has changed quite a bit over the last couple of years. So I, I don't know if you're making that decision now or not, but. Um, that was one of my questions. The other, we're also meeting and using this space on the 20th as the core host and in-person meeting for the consultants to meet with Capital Farm Mutual Aid and hopefully several of their select town board members will be connected. But this will be the in-person place and then everybody else will be remote. For whatever it's worth, I'm planning on going to Barry to, to be there for that meeting. But. I, I don't, yeah, others are welcome to do what makes sense <laughs> for them. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on that? I was planning on just, go, just going remote, just using Zoom. Sure. But if, you know, if, if the group thinks that there's an advantage to all being here in one place, then, that, then that's fine too. But that was my original intention. I don't think it matters. Uh, I would say I would think it's probably doing it remotely I my recollection from the uh, from the last time we did one of those joint meetings it was just all crammed together yeah and that's so true. it was it was suboptimal <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, that's it's fair. Not in a more of a workshop format it's just very not as interfacing as you think it would be yeah no Okay, well, that helps me just to know who may be here and, and how the space will be used. Okay, and um, are we okay with either not appointing someone to, is anybody interested in the, the um, CVPSA position um, that's vacant right now? If not, that's fine. <laughs> so we need to advertise. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, great. Anything else? Uh, no, that's all. Other than I will be in Sweden, and because I'm going because of a severe family illness, mm. I don't really plan to be available. I actually arrived there on the 27th, 
and we'll be in my own little time zone, six hour difference. So I don't know how fit I'll be even to try to do remote in the evening, but I'm trying to make no obligations to uh, interface while I'm gone. That's anyway, fair. so don't do anything I don't approve of. <laughs> Next council meeting, all right? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Uh, Jeffrey. Okay. I'm good too. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, just one really quick thing. So I talked to Bill about this, but there is a an open comment period right now on the PFAS treatment of leachate. Um, I am going to be working on a potential letter for us or for the city because um, I think we should be weighing in on it because we're such a big off taker and I saw that it was a priority of council on our list, um, which I was excited to see. So anyway, just if you see a letter um, going out, I just want to give you the heads up of it's it's a kind of wonky permit process that's ongoing, but because it has ties into like monitoring and stuff that will happen here. Um, I thought it'd be good for us to weigh in with some is, thoughts. Is that the thing at A&R that uh, Connor and I just got an email about? Probably. Okay. From Con Connor and I got an email from Shana Casper saying she'd like to talk to us about it. And so I figured that was... Yeah, good. yeah. I regularly rely on your expertise on PFAS issues. <laughs> Spend more time on it than anyone should. Thanks. <laughs> you and John Oliver. <laughs> Online, we can make an opinion. Yeah, I mean, it's an it's an agency of natural resources yeah. comment period, so we'll just we can like submit a letter. Yeah. Um, I'm oh, sorry, I don't want to cut you off. If you're done. I'm done. Thanks. Yep. Um, just to reiterate, I know that we kind of blew past this um, a few minutes ago, but uh, because we are approaching budget season, I just want to give you a heads up that just like last year, I'll be sending out a uh, survey about what your priorities might be around um, budget and I hope to get that out ballpark uh, late October so just keep that in mind and look for that um, yeah that'll be helpful that's it um, it's John. okay Bill so a few things um, on budgets because we were going to do a presentation tonight I'd, I'd certainly ask you to read through the material that Kelly sent which gives a lot of background information um, and I would say with regard to budget survey which I think is great but I really do appreciate uh, um, you're filling out that straw poll and when we approve that you know this is between the goals you've set and the, those initiatives this is probably the most clear um, policy direction we've ever gotten from the city council going into budget you've really laid out not only what your top priorities were but in order um, so it was very it's helpful for us as we go through that but you know obviously those when we're preparing the budget we'll be thinking about that and as, as you, you'll see from kelly's material you know we, we've got a lot there's a lot of budget pressure this year and we're, we'll be probably talking about even more um, so the next meeting, we will be talking about the budget um, and our, our schedule. Um, we're just taking a look. So we've pushed that off. We'll be trying to do all the strategic planning, the initiatives, and then the final, I think, unless we change our mind on that. But we'd like to have that done prior to budget. Um, we'll be getting a, a presentation for vote and approval on the downtown improvement district. Just. Just trying to have everybody visualize how we're going to spend our time at the yeah. next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Think ahead. Um, I th we, were, we were going to talk about the ARPA funds, uh, the big funds, not just the fifty thousand, but the five or six or seven hundred thousand dollars. We, um, I'll push the. I don't have anything on twelve and sixteen Main Street anyway. We had tentatively scheduled legislative agenda that could probably push. And then we haven't really even talked with our committee yet either. Uh, so that would, and then of course we just added the three things from tonight. So, <laughs> right. So there's that. I was going to remind everybody um, about the next Tuesday's meeting, but we've already covered that. 
And I just want to say a very uh, sincere thank you to all of you and to all of our staff. I've had a lot of professional and personal uh, things going on the last month or so, and everyone's been super supportive and uh, means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Um, all right. So uh, I think that is, that is it. So without uh, objection, we will adjourn this meeting, 10.50. Thanks, everybody.